call the meeting to order. It's six o'clock. First on the agenda, are there any changes or additions, Dan? Yes, there, there are currently errors and admissions on the agenda, but there's another one that just got submitted today. So I think there's a total of three errors and admissions or, or different forms. And please, when we sign those, make sure I get them today because those have to be signed and submitted by the end of this month. So okay. sometimes in the paperwork shuffle things just don't make it down. So when we do those, make sure they get all the way down to me okay. after we sign them. I need you all of us to sign it, right? Yes, please. Okay. Is that it? That's it. All right. Next, to approve the minutes. The minutes of December 2nd, 2019. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is passed. Next, community concerns. First, we have cell tower at the golf course. Do we have anyone here representing that? Yes. Claudia, <laughs> welcome. I just, um, well, I had heard sort of that there was a cell tower going up at the golf course here, close to Pupils Academy, and I didn't really pay that much attention, but recently a cell tower actually got taken down in California in a school, next to a school, because so many kids are coming down with cancer, like an unreasonably high amount. And I think that the cell tower going up next to Pupils Academy, which is the biggest school we have here, is really unconscionable. <clears throat> and I know it's been sort of approved, right? It, it's but been approved and actually it's been constructed. It's been constructed? Yes. Okay, so we need to do something because the kids, if they come down with cancer, you don't want your child to get cancer, right? I mean, it's a serious health concern. And there are over 2,000 studies how toxic cell towers and EMF radiation is. And I think putting it next to a school, when we have new information, we need to look at that, right? Yeah, where's the actual location of the tower? It's, it's on the golf, the Copley golf course. Okay. It's, not, it's not on the campus of the school. I'm not sure if you know that where the tower is. Yeah, it's not on the campus, but as the crow flies, it's what, a few hundred feet, yards? I don't know where it is. I have exactly. 82 Lamphere Road. Morrisville? That's a different one. Yeah. Oh. This one would be, you go down Maple Street and go up. Yeah. Yeah. Down Moore Street on the other side. Yeah. What's I remember it? seeing when they hung the bloom when I lived in the house there. I could look out my window and see the bloom. Right. Which wow. was up and behind where I lived. I mean, I understand we all want good cell phone coverage and we all want that all those things work for us, but we really need to weigh out the cost that it, you know, the price that, it, that we have to pay in order to have that. <coughs> and that brings me to the other thing that I really want to um, add to that discussion, which is 5G. They're rolling it out in different parts of the country and supposedly to make it um, high-speed internet, of course, that we can download a movie in three seconds. and. There have been serious studies that 5G is super toxic, especially to kids with brain development, that it's not a safe technology. And instead of having one cell tower every few miles, we would have one every 500 feet. And we need to really think about that before it hits Morrisville, because I do <coughs> not want that in this town. How close is the cell tower in California to the school? It's by the campus. Like, can you get more specific? Um, I think it's on the campus, but it's a bigger school. Like across the street or a couple blocks away? Is yeah. Close. It would be interesting to have some data on uh, safe distances, you know. Yeah. Or, well, or supposedly, it's, it's a sprint. It was from Sprint, right? That towers. And um, they did testing, and it was within the allowable radiation levels, but um, eight kids came down with cancer within a short period of time, all at the same time. A few different types of cancers, but um, so Sprint measured, they came up with one number, then the school, the parents of the kids had an independent person measure it also. They came up with a higher number, 
still within the allowable guidelines, but when your brain is exposed to it for eight hours a day or seven hours a day, and a child's brain is much more susceptible to radiation damage than an adult brain, it's just too much. And it changes DNA. I mean, it has so many health ramifications, and other countries are doing much more studies about that than the US. For instance, 5G, Belgium does not want to implement 5G because they say it's too health hazardous. Uh, Switzerland is doing studies, and for now they are halting 5G rollout. So I think we are, um, it's a Pandora's box that if we open it, it's much harder to get rid of it again. And if we roll it out, we should really know what we're in for. You know, like I feel I'm pretty sensitive to exposure. So at home, I don't have my Wi-Fi on unless I need to use it. If I have it on for a long period of time, it does make me sort of a little dizzy. I don't like being exposed to it much. If I would have a job in Morrisville and we would have 5G here, I'd have to quit my job. You know, I mean, we need to think about how it really affects people. And there just, there have been over 2,000 studies on EMF damage and that say, yes, EMFs do damage us. Electromagnetic frequencies from different sources. Could be a cell tower, could be the cell phone, could be, you know, 5G, 4G, 3G, but there, is, there are so many studies that say there is damage being done to the body, and 2,000 of them confirm it. 8,000 studies say, yes, there's a possibility. So we can't just say it doesn't exist, you know, just because it's convenient and we have a little faster internet. So I think we need to look at that more, and I feel like we have new data, we need to look at it. So how would you suggest we go about doing that? I think we should, Halt the project if possible. Well, I think the project's already there. Is it there? Is it hooked it's, up? Yeah, it, in, the town really doesn't have an a, a approval process on cell towers. It's at the public service board at the state level. Mm -hmm. right. So they're the ones that really approve these projects, not not the local communities. So that's all done. There, there's input from the local community, but the approval process really lies at the state for, for cell tower placement. And would that also be true for 5G? Because that's also cell towers every 500 feet. Um, any, anything along those lines is going to come from the State Public Service Board. I mean, I know from other places in this country, other states, that it's really up to the community to put a stop on it. So some communities could stop it, other communities could not stop it. And in those that stopped it, it was really up to the community to stop it, not to the state. That's why in some states, places have it and other places don't have it, like 5G rollout. And, um, and I think, you know, we should be super careful whether we want that or not. Go ahead, Brian. So I, I think it's a good idea. I was wondering how we would fix it, because I know we didn't really have any say in it other than we held hearings here. And, and I remember people put out some information. So I think the next thing is, is to go to them and find out what we do, get petitions. Like you said, I think the more people in the community, if we can, they can prove that that's what's happening, need to... Right. But I also think, I think there needs to be more data, not just yes, one study. Can. I mean, it really needs to be like how the independent studies. And, and I can definitely yeah. supply that stuff too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'd be surprised if 5G comes here anytime soon. <laughs> Be very surprised. Well, actually, the, the head of the FCC said it will be in every corner of the U.S. very soon. Yeah, didn't Shumlin say it was going to be internet in Vermont? Yeah, broadband. Yeah. Broadband. And I mean, yeah. we eight do, years ago. We do have other options to have high speed internet. It doesn't have to be frying our brain 24 7. We can have fiber optic and underground cables that would do the same thing. You know, and we could hook into that, and we wouldn't have to be exposed to that all the time. So I think when it comes to this area, I already want to talk about it because it sometimes goes much faster than we think. Right. Well, we appreciate the, the heads up. We certainly would like to see more data. Something like that, if we can't vote on it, it's pretty tough, but maybe we could, you know, collectively give our opinion. Right. that ad hoc committee. Go ahead, ma'am. Oh, I just wanted to ask a couple questions. Um, do we know which company um, put the tower up, or 
who is it like AT and T? Is it Verizon? Is it? Was it Verizon? I'm pretty sure that's a Verizon tower. Yeah. Um, and then, so it's already been put up. It's already been constructed. Yes. Is it functioning already? I, I don't know about the you know because I, I wouldn't have any way to know if it's functioning. Or not. I know it, you know it's, it's been approved at the state level through the public service board, and I know that it's been construction constructed already. Do you know when it was approved? Oh, <sighs> a month or day or that? It's this past summer, I believe, if not last spring. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's been a while. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. Just kind of curious. So I have. Just a printout real quick that someone sent to me that has a few studies um, of harmful effects for persons living close to cell transmission base antennas, cell towers in other words. Um, I'd be more than happy to make a copy of this and so you guys can have a copy of it. And if this is just an example, just a few of them. Um, sure. And then I could send stuff to you too. And then yeah. You distributed on. Yeah. For the public service board, is there um, anyone specifically that we could reach out to or to get more information? From? There's a commissioner of the public service board, so I, you know there's um, you know an administrator for that board. I would reach out to him. Okay. And do we have that name? I don't know the name now. And then what? So what would our options be? Mr. I know you mentioned Mr. Keller something about like petitions, but is there a process in place like if the community decides we would like to halt it for a minute while we as a community examine some um, look through if there's any safety studies or what safety studies what are and then also kind of get a better idea of what is the distance to the school? Is there a process that's in, in the, place for that? Would it be the water and light people she should be talking to? They own the the golf course, right? Yeah, and they, they worked out a lease with them, but I think, you know, the, the, the really, once again, it goes all back, all that goes back to the public's, you know. And who owns the lease for the property? Uh, the Water and Light Department owns the property. Okay. And the golf course. Thank you. Um, but you know, all those questions, I'm, I'm not an expert on the, the public no, service board, so I, you know, but once again, it's the commissioner of the public service board that would have that information for you. But gathering the data and then going to them is probably a good idea. But you could certainly share it with us. And we'd be interested. In so in uh, a week after next, you guys meet again? Yes. Well, like that's no. in uh, oh, no. January 6th. Okay. Right, because the holidays. So um, maybe we can compile some stuff. Yeah. Okay. Can I make a comment about this one thing you've been talking about? You know, cell phones and wireless networks have been in our heads 20 years 1978 first cell came out and people hold them against their head okay. and the rate of brain tumors and other sort of head tumors has not increased over that time now granted children are generally not using cell phones in 1978 right. but i guarantee you they've been using them for the last 10 years it's really a little much, their thumbs have more arthritis than most people will be. Um, and many of the studies that you're talking about, it, that the Dr. Curry, he's been discredited on the world stage. And there's another bunch of studies that have been discredited. The right 5G is a higher radio wavelength. 4Gs are more like our regular radio waves. You know, yeah. FM radio is playing and it's that same wavelength, and we don't fall over dead from the FM ratings, or at least I haven't yet. <laughs> um, but I understand your concerns because the 5G is a higher level wavelength, but they don't, um, the kind of data you're talking about has been discredited. Well, as far as I understand it with wavelength, radio waves, but when we listen to the radio, <coughs> is really big. I mean, literally, a mile long and a mile high. It's a huge wave that goes right through us. When you talk about but 4G... But our current cell phones are on those same radio waves. More on the AS and the As far as I know, they are smaller in the few inch range, the wave itself. And then 5G would be a millimeter wavelength, which yeah. is the smallest wavelength we know. 5 wave 5G is a shorter wavelength. Yes. But it's not even close to the X-ray 
wide ranges which we know does Right. right, but a chest x-ray is a few seconds, maybe, and 5G will be 24-7. Yeah, we don't even have 4G in this time. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> Perhaps tabling this to another, I don't know, I'm yeah. just saying that Thank, that's not... Thanks for the info. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, we'll move on. Capstone, Yvonne, Yvonne Laurie. Yes. Good evening. I've got a couple of handouts for you all. I'm sorry, I don't have one for everybody. I've actually never been to a select board meeting with so many people. That's great. So, thank you. Good one to get my good one to Erica. Okay, so hi, I'm Yvonne, I'm from Capstone Community Action. Um, part of my role at Capstone is to work in development and to manage the town funding process. Um, so I was asked to come here tonight, and I don't know if you had specific questions, but um, I'm more than happy to give a summary of what we do, um, and I plan to show a little video, which hopefully you can see. <laughs> um, and I can share all the materials after the fact, too, by emailing um, Erica, if you like. Um, so, was there anything specific, or would you just like me to... Yeah. Um, so Capstone Community Action is one of a thousand nationwide community action agencies. Uh, we started in 1964 <coughs> through the Eco Economic Opportunity Act, which was in a response to what they call the War on Poverty. So community action agencies started in 1965, and um, we actually started as Central Vermont Community Action Council. And we changed our name in 2014, I believe, to Capstone Community Action. Um, basically, we are one of five community actions in the state, and we cover um, Lamoille, Washington, and Orange Counties, as well as ten, or I'm sorry, nine communities in Windsor, Addison, and Rutland. So we don't really have the Central Vermont. Location, it's kind of based off of you know where the mountain ranges are and such. Um, but we serve Morristown residents, um, and so one of the things you'll see in the packet is the service report, and that just shows how many people we, should, we served through our programs and services in the last fiscal year. Um, so our request for funding has not changed, um, but we have continued to see a need in the community and Lumwell County in general. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about was actually some of the milestones that we accomplished over the last year to try and address some of the needs that we're seeing in the community, you know, including Johnson, um, Eden, even just a lot of the communities in the oil, there's a great need. So um, one of the things we started with at the beginning of the year was a community needs assessment. We had conducted one in 2014, I believe, and one of the results was that we were seeing a higher and higher need in this county. And the way we responded ultimately was to provide more child care. And we created a facility on Industrial Park Drive. And now we have what we call the Early Learning Center. So it's a Head Start program that serves children three to five. And of course, we still offer our home visitor um, services through head, Early Head Start. And we still offer all of our other programs and services. The only exceptions would be um, our Community Kitchen Academy program, which is based out of our Barry office location. And our weatherization staff um, isn't here regularly, but they, they do come up here to provide services, as you can see. And so um, through our Barry office, which is really our main office, uh, we also <coughs> are based out of Randolph, Bradford, and then of course here in Morrisville. So those are the main locations where we provide programs and services for everyone. Um, and basically, through this year's community needs assessment, we um, found that the need in Lamoille County has increased exponentially. 
and that's something we really want to address because um, we also felt like in Lamoille County, once we moved, we started not seeing as many people. Um, some people thought it was because we're no longer next to the food shelf. We didn't host the Bradley food shelf anymore, um, but we're still providing all the same services. Um, so uh, a couple of the stats I wanted to share, which are very, very brief, um, is that through our community needs assessment, um, we surveyed over 1,200 people. And in Lamoille County specifically, uh, we learned that there's the highest rate of poverty in the county. Um, th this is throughout the, um, our service area. The highest child poverty rate, the highest senior poverty rate, the highest unemployment rate, and the highest number of uninsured residents. <coughs> That's Lamoille County. Mm -hmm. Specifically. <coughs> and that's, you we have, have yes, mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm willing to share that too, uh, just additionally. Uh, the highest poverty rate, the highest child poverty rate, uh, the highest senior poverty rate, the highest unemployment rate, and the highest number of uninsured for like medical purposes. Um, and so we've, we're definitely not surprised based off of what we've seen in our, uh, specifically out of our Morrisville office. Um, and so one of the things we've wanted to do as part of this is um, also we had to conduct our strategic plan for the next three years. And so we started a process called um, SOAR, which is your strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results. And basically it was a six week process um, about appreciative inquiry. So instead of looking at the weaknesses of the things we're not necessarily doing well, we're looking at what do we do well. So we prepared a bunch of interviews <coughs> before an event that we hosted in June, and that culminated with a variety of community members, staff, board, um, partners, and um, basically there were over 120 people there, and we went through this whole very active, engaging process. And so we talked a little bit about the ways that we could address some of the concerns that we saw in the community needs assessment, and then more specifically based out of our office locations. Um, so one of the ways we hope to do this is definitely um, through continuing what we call some of our, our milestones. And um, one of the ways we, could, we did that was um, through trauma-informed practices. So we applied for a grant through the CATS Amsterdam Charitable Trust. And basically we piloted the program, which basically meant we had mental health support for the children who are part of our Head Start program, specifically. And the stat about that is nearly eight in 10 kids of more than 300 enrolled in our Head Start program have experienced trauma before the age of six. And so what we're trying to do is replicate this model that we applied for with a grant in some of our other locations. So that's one thing we want to address um, through our facility, continuing through the Early Learning Center. We also opened what we call the Essentials Closet. Uh, we received a donation from Seventh Generation that contained thousands of diapers um, and feminine care products. And this was a way we thought we could address a lot of the homelessness issues that we're also seeing because, as you may or may not know, um, food stamps don't apply to soap, toothpaste, toothbrushes, razors, shampoo, <coughs> diapers, and feminine care. And we were able to get some pers you know, private donations to support the effort. Um, so basically, anybody in Loyal County can come to our facility. They just have to fill out a little bit of paperwork. Um, and that's where we also want to talk to them about some of the services and programs that we offer to see if we can be of further assistance. Um, but we basically have been able to provide all these essential items um, through our doors at this point. And we plan to continue that um, as long as possible, as long as we can fund that. Um, and then we recently got a donation from the Church of Latter-day Saints, and we're going to be starting a winter clothing giveaway. Um, so basically just free winter accessories. Uh, we've got some boots, coats, um, hats scarves, so we're hoping to distribute that um, starting January 2nd. So that's a couple of things that we've been able to accomplish through our Morrisville office um, this year. Um, so then part of the outcome of our SOAR process 
was also that um, we were able to kind of culminate all the information into a strategic plan. And part of our plan was to create a video that talks a little bit about the work we do because we'd be here a lot longer if I talked about each and every service and program. Um, but we think it kind of highlights what we do. And so I'd like to show that. But I don't know if anybody had any questions before I showed it. Yeah. Where's your location again? Here, uh, 250 Industrial Park Drive. <coughs> and then if people wanted to bring donations, they could do that? They could, yeah. I would recommend calling first, just to make sure that there's someone who can like receive them other than just the front desk person. But yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. What do you guys have for like a conduit to um, <coughs> let folks know the service you have? You know, like somebody becomes homeless or whatever and mm -hmm. needs services and, and don't really know. I mean, yeah. you guys are right beside where I work, and people mm -hmm. ask me all the time, what is Capstone? What do they do? Yeah, you yeah. Know, well, it's great to hear part that. Of it is, um, we've, we've been working with a lot of the local community. I mean, in all of our counties, we're working with community partners. So anyone who's working with homelessness-related issues, um, like we work with the, the Council on Aging a lot. Um, we've worked with the Family <coughs> Center, all the mental health facilities. Pretty much anybody we can work with and right. partner with, um, we're working with. So I think the struggle we've had since we've built the new location is how do we get the word out? Right. We're not sure. <laughs> and even the folks who are residents of Morrisville, Johnson, Hyde Park, they, don't know. they still have a struggle. Yeah. Um, you know, we try really hard to get into the local papers and write things that are you know appropriate. We try to get on the radio. Um, we still use social media. We ask our staff to post on Front Porch Forum. Um, so any advice actually is very welcome. Well, I'm sure, you know, the, the police, fire, and EMS Absolutely. personnel are going to be front line to, to seeing folks like that yes. and provide help. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a big one. I'm and assuming. they actually help us with a lot of trainings as well. So You're saying like the guidance counselors at the schools probably are very so aware of the school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, the schools. And I mean, I think we've learned that we can't assume that people right. know. Um, and we do know that we had a very dedicated long-term staff, Sandy Neely, who I'm sure you, many of you may know. Um, she was part of our staff I, I mean, from the very beginning. Um, so with her passing and everything, I think we saw the change and transition of the relationship. And so she just was very close knit with particularly Lamoille County residents. So that's something that we tr strive to get back, you know, back to that. Um, and also just if we can offer community support, you know, like we've talked about, we have a great driveway. So if we could find a safe way to do an event outside, even like touch a truck or something, you know, like right. we'd love to do something like that or child safety seat checks or something like that. Yeah. We have a lot of ideas, it's just implementing them. <laughs> right, well <laughs> it makes, makes me think about, wasn't too long ago, there was a gentleman I saw at the uh, Irving station who didn't have any gas, he mm. ran out of gas and he didn't have any money, and I uh, filled his gas can up for him, mm. and he was just traveling through the area, from, wow. you know, and I felt really bad, I just filled his gas can, but I felt like, you know, there's services out there that can help, mm -hmm. you know, and um, how does one find those services, mm -hmm. you know? If I hadn't come along, I'm sure you would have done something, yeah. but, you know. Well, 211 also has been a really great resource because they're very good about connecting with us, um, especially when we have, like, a holiday closure. Now that they're, I think they're back to 24 hours a day, but um, it's a free service that we also recommend to people. If it's, this, like, one of the few services we don't offer, we recommend they contact 211 because they always have an up-to-date record of who in the state, you know, has that program or service or can yeah. offer some support. Because um, local churches do a lot. They do a lot in our communities to yeah. support our, our low-income families, so. Get the word out. Yeah. Please. Lee, go ahead. How many staff members do you have and how do they get paid mm. in uh, the new building you just built? Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was over a half million dollars. Yeah. It's Apple. Probably uh, closer to a million. Well, Howard owns the property, right? I think. Yeah. <coughs> Where did you get this money? Um, a lot of places. So a lot of our staff are, are grant funded positions. Um, something that's unique about community action programs is that they are part of the community service block grant. And so we are allotted a certain amount of federal funds 
that we can use um, to provide support services and programs. Um, but we have to do a lot of fundraising, a lot. Um, so we've got federal, we've got state, we have private, public. Um, that's a lot of funders. Um, and then one of the things, of course, we do is we ask our towns who are the, we're serving residents for money. So more down as well. Great service. I have another question. Yeah. Um, you said that 1,200 people were surveyed mm -hmm. to come up with the numbers for lowest, you know, lowest and everything. Mm -hmm. Well, um, or highest part everything. of it, it, actually, so we had the survey done, but it also is compared to what's called the American Community Survey and some other like major statistical um, databases that the federal government uses. And so actually a lot of that gets compiled into the assessment. So we can only use so much of our own personal data, but then we're using that federally um, database, yeah. And so something that's also really important that I should mention is um, for people to fill out the 2020 census. That is also a way that we get a lot of funding for our programs is if people show, you know, like first of all say, you know, what their, about their demographics, um, and then that also affects how how much money we get. So that's a way any community member can help support the the, the greater good. <laughs> so that twelve hundred people you guys did personally interview. So not personally for that, um, because that was essentially a written survey. So unless somebody had a reading or writing. Um, you know, disability, I guess, it's not, it's not PC, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if in that instance, that would be the only time that we would actually have a face-to-face -face interview, is if we need to have that. Is there any correlation between the huge drug problem we have in Memorial County and your statistics, or how um, would you know that? That's a good question. I don't think I've ever personally looked into that, but I wouldn't say it wouldn't affect it because we definitely see the epidemic all the Well, that's what I'm saying. With yeah. that many children having mm -hmm. trauma before yeah. age six, I would say the majority of them are probably because of drugs. Yes, yeah, this no? day and age, I'd say it could be a good guess. <clears throat> well, one of, the, one of the things that drives that statistic up is the fact that all the social services are located here, mm -hmm. which is a you know, that's what brings our numbers way up. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, people or who people are seeking assistance too, yeah. And it's not just drugs, it's alcohol as well, well and, and you know, a lot of other yeah. substances. You have to remember her stats <coughs> for the whole county. The, well, the, the eight out of ten is it just more so. one county. Right. Yes. Okay, sorry. Because yeah. yeah. I know there was a housing survey done, what, 2014? 2016, and Johnson was the community had the highest poverty rate in Lamoille County. Not that we're not immune, but it, just to keep it in perspective. And so I'm going to try and show a video. I don't know how this is going to look. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so this is a video we created as a result of our strategic plan and all of the things that we've been doing um, this year. So hopefully it will all... Oh dear. Oh, no, we don't have 5G, so. <laughs> <laughs> so far, good luck. Good one, Judy. She's got a sharp tongue today. I love it. <laughs> I think we're up on the I'm not sure why it's happening. Are you linked into their web? It says I am. Yeah. Let's double check. I think we got to turn I've yeah. Going down too much. Yeah, it says it's connected. No, it's not working. Oh dear. There could be too many cell phones on. I'm not making a joke. Yeah. Right. Um, let me see if I can try this. All the bandwidth is being. Oh, I'm going to try one other way. Yeah. Oh. Oh, okay, good. Let me just make sure the volume is Now, where is that building? Um, this is our office building in Barrie. Oh. Oh, I've seen that. That's behind the... Is that next to the co-op? 
Um, no, it's not. not at all. Your resources. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Not sure. My wife gets a check one week. I get one, then, you know, a couple weeks later, and then I get one from the VA. It's just, you know, you've got to plan. You know, you've got to plan all your money for a year. Yeah. You know, and then you have to plan for your other money. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but we could leave that information. We'd be happy to do that. Or even just have a video running during the during um, the time when we're not having a meeting. But yeah. There are people there, and they do put up tables and oh, um, okay. uh, mm -hmm. like kind of advertise what they do and what yeah. benefits what uh, they have to offer to the community. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I've provided you guys with. Um, the, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. the latest and annual report, so it's not for this current year, it was last year's. So right. It won't be read until February, but um, the last thing was a brochure about their general services and programs. So at least that's something in the meantime, give you an idea. And what we're trying to do now is do like a brand new refresh. So um, hopefully we could have something new by March, if that's possible. So all depends on the budget. <laughs> Thank you for doing the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> <clears throat> All right, next, number three, Central Vermont Council on Aging. Thanks. I I have a chair up here. Good evening. Hi. I think I assumed there was a chair here for me to yeah, sit in. Yeah, there usually is. Okay. Can we get a chair? <clears throat> can hear me yes okay so good evening um, my name is Mary Hayden I'm the director of development and communications at the Central Vermont Council on Aging thank you from us at the Central Vermont Council on Aging for this opportunity to address the select board this evening and to thank the citizens of Morristown for their generous support for so many years at Central Vermont Council on Aging, our vision is a world where aging is honored. Our mission is to support Central Vermonters to age with dignity and choice. We are leading experts and advocates on healthy aging for Central Vermonters. Our core, our core values are self-determination, dignity, and respect for the choices of older persons to age at home, remain healthy, and to stay active and connected to the communities they know and love. <clears throat> We are incorporated as a 501c3 since 1980, and we are one of five area agencies on aging in Vermont authorized to provide services under the Federal Older Americans Act. Funding for Central Vermont Council on Aging comes primarily from the Older Americans Act, which is a federal statute, from state funding and fundraising. We serve individuals who are 60 and above in 54 towns in central Vermont, including Morristown, Morrisville, and Lamoille County, Orange County, except for the town of Thetford, Washington County, as well as the towns of Bethel, Hancock, Granville, Pittsfield, Rochester, Royalton, Sharon, and Stockbridge. Our budget is approximately $3.7 million, and funds from town funding from 54 towns account for less than 2% of our budget. As stated, we support aging central Vermonters in their choices to age at home, remain healthy and stay active and connected to their communities. So how do we do that? If you came to Central Vermont Council on Aging because you are experiencing challenges as you age, we will meet with you and your family members in your home or at our office create an indiv individualized plan for you, and if needed, coordinate your services for your long-term support at home. This may include information and assistance, counseling on your options for services, benefits, and referrals, ongoing case management to coordinate your services, Medicare counseling and enrollment assistance, sign you up for Meals on Wheels or other wellness activities, refer you to the Family Caregiver Support classes and Dementia Respite Grants, refer you to mental health services and legal services tailored to meet the needs of seniors. We arrange for transportation, housing, and fuel assistance, provide cash assistance to cover critical emergencies such as fuel home and home repairs. We have a robust volunteer program where we assign a volunteer who could provide support 
again with transportation, light housekeeping, and companionship. We're the sponsor agency for RSVP, which is a retired senior Vermont program uh, for volunteers 55 and older, as well as senior companions, <clears throat> and programs supporting volunteers 55 and older who provide services to Vermonters in their homes and communities. <coughs> We also have a helpline available Monday through Friday during regular business hours. So in your materials, uh, I've included some specific data related to our services to the residents of Morristown and Morrisville. So last year we provided unduplicated services to 266 residents of Morristown, and when I say that I mean Morris, people who identify as living in Morrisville and Morristown. Some major challenges seniors in your community are facing, and I don't think these are going to surprise anyone, um, are in the areas of housing, prescription drug costs, and paying for heating fuel. Um, finding new housing for homeless or precariously housed seniors who may be couch surfing is increasingly difficult, but so is maintaining existing housing when balancing the high cost of prescription drugs and heating fuel. Also, the federal administration is currently very interested in cutting access to three squares Vermont or food stamps. And that would apply to seniors as well as um, younger families. So I just wanted to point to some of the data that I've provided you on the third page. Um, and this, this breaks down the data in specific areas and gives you may, maybe a better idea about what your folks are receiving in terms of services, which can hopefully help you understand the needs. And so 50, I don't want to read them all to you, but for example, 100 people last year needed information and assistance, which is how we connect people to benefits and programs or help them get back on track. So. If the fuel tank is going to run out before the cold weather runs out, that's an example of where we can step in and try to find some assistance for folks. Meals on Wheels, um, you have a very robust Meals on Wheels program, as you know, in Lamoil County, which is situated here. Um, a lot of folks are signed up for Meals on Wheels, which is really good. That means that they are getting nutritious meals at home. They're also getting a check by their volunteer driver who can spot problems before they can really get bad, hopefully. Um, but you also have a high participation level there in your community meals, um, which is great. That means people are getting out who can still get out and get to their meal sites and enjoying a nutritious meal. And they're also enjoying the socialization that comes with that. Um, some other areas, Medicare assistance is really high. Um, we're happy to report that we are delivering a free workshop in your neck of the woods. It's called Medicare and You. It's a free program to help people sign up initially for their Medicare so that they sign up correctly and they don't overpay and they don't get sort of caught up in some of the um, selling tactics that may go on um, when um, folks are being encouraged to sign up for Medicare. But we also have individual Medicare appointments and health insurance appointments. So if somebody needs assistance in any area, we can see them, as long as they're 60 and older. Um, also, we, we are allowed to pr provide Medicare assistance to folks who are adults who are disabled, who may be on, but, but are under 60. So that expands that population a bit. We also have um, programs with um, your local mental health agency and there's a particular program called the elder care program in all our all through our service area so if someone has mental health needs and they're senior they can get a referral to see a counselor who specializes in helping seniors with their mental health and, and the appointments are in their homes typically so they're house calls by therapists so folks are very comfortable typically getting that help. Um, legal services as well. I, I th mentioned self-neglect clients only because um, it, it appears to be a low number, but it's, it's, it drives a very high um, 
uh, resource response when we identify any self-neglecting uh, residents uh, in your population. So I'm happy to answer any of your questions. I've provided you with a brochure. Thank you. Do you happen to have, I was speaking with a woman whose husband has dementia, and um, she said there wasn't any like support group available. I asked if she was getting any um, any help. Is I think someone comes in once a once a week, which I know if you're the primary caregiver, that isn't enough. Is there any plans, or <coughs> would that be something your group would do? Is is organize right. a support group for um, caregivers? Right. So we currently we have a, a program, a six week program called Powerful Tools for Caregivers. It's not called a support group per se, um, and that's only because some some folks who who are older, they're they are not always excited about that term. So it's it's called powerful tools for caregivers, and it's an intensive course that is a combination of support and education <coughs> and tools for um, um, finding ways to get a break and to lower stress and um, find strategies that work for family caregivers. We have a really robust family caregiver program. Another thing that we have, and in particular with the case you mentioned, it may be relevant, that we actually have a dementia respite grant. Mm. Um, that is provided through the state. It is available to family caregivers of loved ones with a dementia diagnosis. Um, because they typically get in this sort of 24-7 caregiving role and at some point their health can be mm -hmm. jeopardized, mm -hmm. their well-being. So this grant allows us to sign people up, qualify them, and then we can bring in hopefully more than once a week. Um, some respite for um, any number of things because they have some flexibility. They could use the money, for example, to go on a trip to visit their family who lives in another part of the country, or they could use that to um, go to one of our groups for support, and a lot, and those funds could be used, for example, to bring someone in to stay with their loved one with dementia, or pay for them to be an adult day for the for the day, or so. So there's a lot of different ways that we can help them through that grant as well. We also do individual counseling, so I always recommend that people call and talk to our family caregiver director um, who can really point them in a lot of different directions. Because in that situation, it sounds like they need more respite than they're getting. Mm -hmm. It's a really critical area in the caregiving. Um, Another great program. Yeah, I agree. Any questions? Well, I just wanted to say thank you again for um, all of the support we've received over the years from this community. It's it's um, you know we have we have an office of three people who, who work directly out of the office up here. It's a we have a lot of clients from this area, and so your help and support through town funding is really critical for us. And thank you so much. And thank you to all of the citizens who are here for listening. Hopefully. Well, thank you. I know that the, um, at the last town meeting, the, one of the residents or several people asked the select board to invite the people we give appropriations to come and talk to us so we knew what they were, what services they were providing the community. So that's, for the audience, that's why we've, uh, you're having these presentations. And we always try to have someone available at your town meeting in case some questions arise uh, along those lines on the spot in the moment yeah. to help people make a decision. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for coming in. I interrupted you. Can you say something else? Okay. Next we'll do uh, GMTA, Jen Wood. Hello. So I just put together a little pack of info I want to share a little bit about uh, GMT and then so we'll leave time for questions. Sure. Okay. All right. So I'm, 
My name is Jen Wood. I'm the relatively new public affairs and community relations uh, manager for Green Mountain Transit. And so um, this is my first round of select board meetings in this role. So, <laughs> And I uh, wanted to just share, as I said, a little bit of information about GMT. And um, But first start by you know, thanking first for your service, uh, being on the select board. I know what that entails. And then for the support that um, Morristown has given to Green Mountain Transit. Um, and so in my role, I'm working really with the, the rural service areas, which is a, um, anything outside of Chittenden County. So the, the one piece that I'm going to talk a little bit to is the, the more colorful two-sided one sheet. Um, so we are uh, the largest uh, and only transit authority in Vermont. So our service area covers 50% of the public transit in Vermont. The rest serviced by um, seven other transit agencies around Vermont. And we, um, when we merged, we had been CCTA and GMTA, and those entities mer merged the urban and rural um, transit providers, and then we became Green Mountain Transit, had a char charter change in our technically um, municipality. Um, and so, and we serve uh, five counties in Northwest Vermont, and you can see in the diagram there, kind of the, the service area where we provide transit, um, you know, in a number of different capacities from um, paratransit to the, the large link buses that we have. And in there, this is information that you would have received just through the, the funding request, is also just uh, our annual report around the routes, the, the ones specific to Morrisville as well as the Mountain Road shuttle um, that Morris, Morristown, sorry, <laughs> folks have access to. So, um, and we, you know, have requested um, level funding, the same amount for, for years now. This is the 5,763, and as part of that, I wanted to share where we're at in terms of evaluating a number of pieces that go into that. So on the urban side of our, um, in the Chittenden County, we have a different structure where there's, the towns are members, and we get 80% of our funding from the federal government, and we're supposed to get this 20% local match. And they, as members, they, um, we do an assessment which, with a, what's called a fair share equation that looks at census data and a number of other factors to calculate what their fair share of the, of the cost for, to cover their 20% match. And so, um, and through the power of taxation, we say, okay, Burlington, here's your share, Winooski, and they um, give us that with a 3% increase each year. And then on the rural side, it's, we get the 80% state funds and then we do have been doing this process for the local match of um, this role, kind of going to the towns, submitting the funding requests, doing the petitions, and and so for part of that, you know, there's a number of factors for the the level funding, but it's been one person working with about 50 towns, so to be able to get all of the signatures and all of those steps has been a bit onerous. So it's um, you know depending upon the criteria, we've just again level funded, but we're also finding that we're having to you know obviously not this year, but wanting to start to have the conversation with towns to look at, you know, what the actual cost of the 20% local match would look like, you know, so. And we're, uh, as part of that, also evaluating the way in which we calculate that. We have a consultant working on, you know, a more robust analysis to, to look beyond census data, but also ridership and funds that the town contributes. And, you know, for some of our rural towns, there's just a pass through and not a stop. Obviously, there's stops and roads specific to Morristown, but to make sure that the calculation is, is equitable. Um, so I, um, and I, you know, I got some quick data today in terms of, I know the, the statistics in the annual report were for FY19, but for current date, at least the, the ridership that's coming out of, you know, riders that are getting on and off in Morristown, that percentage has gone up. So they're increased in terms of participation in this town. So. Do your routes, um, they, they go from here to Waterbury, then to Burlington, and from here to Montpelier and Barrie, <coughs> and here to Hardwick, yes? We have a lot more routes than that. But, yeah. but, but, so for, but the Sirs and Loyal County are to Morristown. To be able to access, yeah, I mean, and then aside from sort of Medicaid and other rides that are more scheduled rides that we do that are you know the typical route buses that might that where um, anybody can sign who's eligible for those services you know sometimes it's through volunteer drivers or smaller vehicles to transport. Um, Is there a route going to Johnson? To Johnson, um, <coughs> in in our territory, I don't believe. 
Um, I'm still, again, very new in learning all of the routes, but for your, um, I guess I'm going to double check that, but I don't think that there are, um, that there is one to check. How does one get a, a route increased, like a route to go to another town where there isn't any? There's, a, yeah, I mean, I think that's a larger sort of planning discussion and that we would, you know, work with the state, the trans, who um, gives us funds for, you know, adding new routes, and then we would work with the, the towns that would be participating in that, and sometimes, you know, getting, if there's um, local businesses, say, for instance, that are interested, if, you know, that's sometimes what helps create a route if there's, you know, um, places at the either point where there's interest to getting, say, workers or people um, to those locations that they partner in that conversation. And then it's part of the overall, you know, eva evaluation of is it feasible, you know, is the ridership there to um, correspond with the cost of the route. So I know MSI is, is, <coughs> is bringing people in from Chittenden County. And I think a lot of it has to do with transportation about getting, I don't know, I'm just speculating, getting workers to mm -hmm. that business. And right. we don't have the transportation system. It's fairly located going to Burlington um, or Montpelier. So it's going away from the county and not mm -hmm. being provided necessarily within the county for the people who live here and, and want to work within the county. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and before I started, they had done oops called the next gen um, study and analysis looking at both the urban and rural to assess kind of the routes and there I think believe that they had public forums to have conversations around you know what's working what's not working and some of that implementation of the rural side has been put on hold because now we're doing another um, kind of more broad analysis to, and the uh, people within GMT are putting together kind of a matrix that's um, going to assess all the routes um, to evaluate how they're performing and in the funding piece because the the reality on the green mountain transit side is that um so we haven't been getting anywhere close to the 20 percent match on the local side from all the rural towns mm -hmm. and so gmt has just been backfilling that and paying for that with reserve funds and those funds are gone and so we're having to really you know look closely <coughs> to see you know how dollars are being spent and and then to evaluate the routes and then as and I don't have, you know, this is in the very preliminary stages, so I wouldn't have any indication where Morris Town would fall into that. But then if it's, you know, if it's, say, one of the struggling towns, then that would be, you know, again, another conversation to look at, um, you know, preserving the routes that we have um, and getting, and then having conversations about the, the match and trying to work, you know, whether it's with local businesses or if there's other entities and ways to be creative to help to support the funding for the routes to to sustain what we have. I'm hoping to expand routes, but we're having to look also at just sort of sustaining what we currently provide. So. Any questions? Great program. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. You had a I question? Said, are there, do you guys, is it fares? <clears throat> there are fares and they vary um, <coughs> by route and area. So if they're kind of like the link, the commuter buses are a little more expensive than say some of the local um, circulator routes, but it's different in different regions, so it's on our website, it's all broken down by which route you want and how much it costs. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks thank all. You. Thank you. All right, is there any other community concerns? We'll move to, is there any liquor control tonight? See Sarah. Sarah's no? not here. All right. Oh, business. Well, are, are, are we under your concerns? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> Lee. We're not. Lee. We, I, was, I was going to wait for the uh, storm <laughs> damage update for you. What? Would you rather be in that or would you rather be on your own? On our own. we got to get out of here. Okay. Go, <laughs> uh, go ahead. <laughs> But you guys make sure anyone that's here tonight if they can introduce themselves. Well, there's a bunch of us here from Mud City. Yes. And we're very concerned about the bridge um, below my house. Uh, which Mudbrook. Yeah, Mudbrook. It was uh, uh, the culvert was damaged. And we've been told right along uh, that it was going to be a quick fix for the winter. That uh, it would, they would make it passable for the winter for us and fix it in the spring. Well, 
as of Friday, we found out that that's not true. They're not going to do it now. And now we have to go from, say, Rooney's or as There's Christie's. There's only one way left. The other round. There's only one way, the worst possible way that right. there could be down past Lapine. But by the way, somebody better call the town tonight because the sign that said road closed blew down last night. The plow truck was up today. He never put the sign back up. So we know the road is closed, but a stranger wouldn't, and they're going to go in the drink. Anyway, when you get to Coal Hill, at the bottom of Coal Hill, you've got over four miles to their house. You've got five miles right. all uphill. Now, in mud, like last week when the mud broke open, our road impassable. was almost impassable. Yeah. And it's all uphill. If you have a car, you can't live there. Now, it's not like we're new there. I've lived out there over 50 years. They've been there forever. They've been there. Uh, even Rooney's are ticked off about this. Uh, in fact, the other day when we had ice, their hired men waited two hours at the bottom of Coal Hill to get up to do chores. They don't come on time. And it's re it's gotten ridiculous. We need that bridge passable. Oh, after it, after we had the meltdown, right? The normal procedure for the 25 years I've been here is that when it freezes at night, they come with the grater. No. no. It was in the morning, the grater was sitting in one spot. He never did anything. So what does this new supervisor do? He waits till mid-afternoon and sends these huge trucks with sharp rock. And the, their ruts were frozen, two feet high, and filled it in with all these sharp rocks. So Friday, I had to have my oil changed in Vienoy. And the guy said, Merry Christmas if we don't see you. And I said, that's if I don't get a flat tire. Damn it, I woke up yesterday morning and got a flat tire. And here is my proof that it's from the sharp rocks, because I spent the entire day today sitting at Vianor waiting for my tire that got a hole torn in it from a sharp rock. We've always, had, we've always had when the uh, the you you had the meltdown. The town grader would be out at midnight right. if it was going to freeze, right. and they would uh, hone the road so it'd be passable in the morning. Well, that's not happening now. It's a little ridiculous that we have to put up with this at twenty almost twenty twenty now. We have to put up with this. When you can't own a car to get back and forth to work or leave your home, you have to have a truck or a four-wheel drive. Or, no, that, it, it's totally absurd. Now, we've lived out there forever, and at least we've been able to get back and forth. Now, with the the Going down past Rooney's, we cannot do it. There were three people this week I, that did not go to work for two days because they couldn't get off. You've got gas trucks, you've got oil trucks, you've got uh, no, uh, sawdust no. trucks going up to Rooney's, you've got uh, the milk truck. The milk truck driver was so scared last week because of the meltdown, he thought he was going to tip over. Yeah. You can't keep going that far uphill. It's totally absurd. Yep. Now, they were able to fix down by Crownlebergs, which was a hole in the road eight foot deep or that more. That man almost got killed in. That had a cover. Why couldn't they fix that? They fixed the one in Sterling Valley. Why can't they make that? Bridge passable. Just passable for this winter. David Rooney went down there this morning with a guy from Blow and Cody's and said there's no 
way they can't make that passable. He said, it, it's a simple solution. Now, I called the governor's office and he put me in touch, with, or somebody from his office put me in touch with somebody else who then the Agency of Transportation. They told me the town takes care of um, number two roads, number three roads, and the bridges. They send the money to the towns. Why isn't that bridge fixed? It's been now seven weeks and we're still putting up with it. Now you're telling us we have to wait five more months? We can't make it through a mud season going that far uphill. That is totally absurd. And when the Halloween storm happened, right? And you couldn't go on the site by Cromwellberg's where he said that went out because Anna almost got killed. She put her car in there and told her car, right? But on our side, which was open, the side we're going down now, there were holes big enough for a school bus to go in. No pylons for a week. Not even a pylon. I knew the holes were there because I saw them in daytime. But somebody else could have gotten killed. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. This guy is an idiot. The and Beaver, a total idiot. The Beaver Meadow Road still hasn't been honed. <clears throat> right, Brendan? No. Nope. It still no. hasn't been honed. And, and it's been what? Yeah. Over a week now. What yeah. is going on with this highway department? You know, you know what? It's, it's all of a sudden we had a town highway department, we had a village highway department. Last summer we very seldom ever got honed or graded the roads. Because why? They were working down here in the village the whole time. That's totally absurd. Do you want to comment on, on this? Well, first, you know, um, last summer we didn't have any construction projects so the, the highway crew wasn't in the village last summer working our, you know hard no, whatever yeah, um, yeah, but yeah. Tyler Mudley's here he's the one civil engineer that did the inspection on the culvert because um, I you know I'm not an engineer so I, I rely upon him to after the storm to go out he did big culverts for us so this is not the, the culvert size is a lot different than the other ones replaced and just fixing this one, Tyler, I'll let you explain what you saw along that culvert up there. Yeah, so we, you know, went out there with Kevin and we visited the site. And, you know, there's, the biggest thing that we saw is that you go out there, it's, it's a big pipe, and I, I crawled down there, we went down there and looked at that pipe, and that pipe is deflected, it's depressed. And I don't know if anybody's been in that, down in there and looked at it, but that pipe is, is, is gone. Is Tyler, gone. you know what is, we were able still with it broken up, we were still able to drive one side of it right. until they put all the barriers down. Uh, there's no reason why part of that can't, it, in the first place it was built wrong to begin with. It's, it, it goes straight like this, but the brook <coughs> comes like this. Why in the hell didn't they put the culvert the way the brook ran? Not, and so now that's what caused the water to run underneath it. Well, that's the thing is that the, the road is, is much higher than, than the, the stream where the right. pipe is, right? right. So you have, the, you have a very large pipe and you have a lot of fill on top of the pipe, right? So what I was, what I was saying is that the pipe itself is, is depressed, and we can all agree that that happened. We can all agree that there are significant depressions in the road as well, right? The, the soil, the earth, the roadway, all the substance there, it, it is down. It, it went somewhere. But what we also know is that there was not a significant amount of headwater coming up to that road level. So I, I wasn't there exactly when it happened. I had talked to Kevin, but based on what I saw in the field and what he had saw when he showed up, when this had happened is that the water did not press over the, over the pipe, did not press up over the road, meaning there was not any significant washout, right? So washout is when water finds its way into voids, into anything, and it grabs soil and pulls and it gets rid of it, right? So when you, you have that process going over and over again, that's a major washout. A solution to a washout is to put fill back and then stop the, the flow of water through the soils. 
But what, what really scared me about this whole situation was that it did not appear that there was any significant washout. It didn't seem like there was water flowing into the, that roadway area above the pipe. The water had crested up above that pipe, so there was no water in that area. And there was a sniffing depression in the pipe, meaning if that water, the soils of that road were not washing out and it just collapsed down on that pipe, the biggest fear is that that can just keep happening and that the pipe just completely collapses, the road falls in. The road will fall in. So the, the, the idea of the simple solution is, is well, go, go put more fill back, right? Fill it in, compact it back. But I was fearful, and my recommendation to the town was that you want to avoid that. Because if you put more fill back and then you compact it, you're only just waiting for the next time that that pipe is going to depress even more. Well, we were told they were so going. What's, the, what's well, the difference if they do it now or in the spring? Do we so not have the we're, money? We're talk, we're, the, the, the conversation really becomes, you know, what what is the quick fix versus what is what is the real correct law? Well, the quick fix is they told us they were going to put a steel plate across it and then cover it with gravel for the winter. What, what happened to well, that? Well, I don't know who told you that because I don't think what? we really ever seriously talked about footy. We, we talked about trying to do some temporary repairs. We tried to get a temporary bridge from the Agency of Transportation. So we were even encouraged to apply for a temporary bridge. They said, and a good example of the temporary bridge is the, the Tinney Bridge that used to be up. Bailey Bridge. Right. That's, it's, it's a maybe bridge, like a Bailey okay. Bridge. So we filled out the application like we were told to, sent it to the Agency of Transportation like we were told to, and then they said no to us that we're not going to put one in. And I got that word last week. Well, yeah, why? If they already told me that the town takes care of their own bridges. But we don't have any temporary bridges. You know, it's not something that we carry. And the state is the one that, that places temporary okay. bridges. So is it the state that decides that this isn't going to happen? I'm not talking temporary. I'm talking about permanent fix. The, the per Can that not happen this the, time of year or, well, the, or is it the money end? It's only a culvert. Why can't it happen this time of the year? It's not what about is wrong money. with that? Go ahead, Tyler. Well, so, I mean, there was, some, there was a discussion about what could be a, a kind of in-between fix, right? Like putting concrete abutments or kind of some roadway over there. The problem Tyler, like, it used to be just a little wooden bridge. My God, uh, they put a culvert in. Uh, there's no reason why it can't be replaced with another one. And that's what I'm talking about. So if you want to replace that culvert, then you're taking all that, all that earth out of there. You're taking that culvert out of there, and you put it back something that's not going to fail again. Right? right. That's, that's very so likely a concrete, box culvert, a concrete box culvert. It's a very significant and expensive structure. It has to be designed, and it has to be, it has to be created. And that takes time. And the whole process, they get it designed correctly and all Are that, they designing it out. now for the spring? Why don't you, they yeah, yeah. Start why don't you let him finish yeah, you guys, why you guys let him finish him? before you interrupt him? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank My you. Uh, the, the answer is no, we're not working on it right now. We are hoping for, the town is hoping for a temporary grid from VTrain. So this is the conversation right now. What I'm saying is that, you know, with, within the short time span, you, you can't get a box culvert in there and get all that construction done. So it takes time to get that accomplished. So the conversation is here now. You know, there, uh, my recommendation is not a quick fix to put fill back in there and open it up. Okay. And I also don't recommend even the intermediate fix because you don't know what's going on with the soils around that pipe. You don't know where the washouts are. There's a head wall that's there, and the rocks and the riprap around the head wall look to be doing a decent job, but there's also signs that the head wall may have moved recently. There's right. any fix that takes us through the next spring. So what? Is there any fix that takes us through the next <coughs> spring? I, I, I don't see it right now. I think I think the best fix, the most appropriate thing to do, both financially and for a, a correct thing to do for that for that bridge, for that stream, is to fully design it, get the whole thing out of there, and put a box culprit in. And is that, can you do that before the spring? Um, yeah. yeah, the state typically has rules against kind of doing that winter, uh, oh, winter it's, work, but it takes time to get so that means it might not happen. It takes time to get it constructed. You know, and it's like, well, could you stop? Uh, we can certainly start it now and see what the state would be doing as far as and why can't you do it in the winter? In the winter, because of the state. I mean, why? Why? why the state usually has uh, uh, restrictions against winter time activities for things like yeah. this. Agency and natural resources, you have to go through permitting They're and everything. Yeah. It's not yeah, yeah, quick. Just on the farm down the road, but. Um, well, why, why do they say you cannot do it in the winter? Uh, I mean, for that reason, I mean, there's, that's a, 
the Why inner. Are you, that, you, know, you know what I'm really scared of? I have a friend that lives in Eden, and he said a number of years ago they had four bridges to get into his neighborhood. All four went out. The environmental people came along and said, uh-uh, can't rebuild them. They only rebuilt one. So there's only one way out of his area, right? I'm scared that's going to happen to us. Are the environmental people going to come in and say the water's screwed up or something and we're not going to get a bridge on that side? Is that possible? Uh, I think it's possible, but I, oh, I don't see why that would occur. Tyler, why can't you just take the culvert out and put a culvert in for the winter? You can, it's just a lot of work and it's very expensive. Well, it's a lot of work, but you know what? Last year I paid over $11,000 in taxes to the town of Morristown. Not counting what they pay, what the Rooney Farm pays, anybody else up there. We have a right to get some service. We don't, by the time an ambulance gets up there, yeah. we're dead. That's the fire the department, your house is burned down. You'll be lucky if we got the, the only thing we get up there is road service. And now we're not even getting that. That's a little ridiculous. And you wonder why we're mad about it. I think you mentioned that there was an idea to put it in steel plates and that was held up because you thought you were going to get the bridge. Did I understand that correctly? No, no, the, the immediate plan was to potentially get a, a full temporary, temporary bridge. bridge. We asked for a 40. It was mentioned in steel plates. I said no. Well, I don't know where that is. I was no, told no, a steel plate. Oh, that's, oh, that's right. Okay. No, I, I was told a steel plate over it, and then they were covering it with gravel. I, I think that would be completely and totally unsafe. Number one, you can't see what's going on. You know, the steel plates aren't designed to hold traffic, buses, or tractor trailers. So, so who told you that? Was any of us? Uh, a highway uh, foreman told me that, and. I got it from your office also. No, I talked about a temporary bridge because that's what we were asked to do, is to, to ask for, and, and we did. We applied for a 40-foot temporary bridge. And just to be clear, even replacing the culvert, we would still have to have permitting from the state to work in the stream. Well, that permitting should have been started the day after the flood. We, we just got the denial last week yeah. for the bridge. Our, the, the quick fix was that temporary bridge. We, we put our eggs in that basket because that was the quickest fix. The design, uh, to get the permits, get the bids out, do all the things we need to do to replace and put in a box culvert, not a, a multi-plate culvert, it, it, it's going to take more time than we have between now and spring. So are they not going to start? You know, so far it's suburban. No, we're not talking about not starting the design process okay. or starting the permitting process. We okay. know that bridge needs to be replaced. We okay. want to replace it ourselves. Okay? I'm just saying that the timeline is not realistic between now and spring to have a box culvert put into that road. The thing well, is, we get a box culvert permit on the ground so I understand what you're saying. What we can do is get this thing rolling now, tonight. We can start the process, right. see how fast we can do it, you know, and do it the right way. Bob, coming up from my house, say you come out of my driveway, Borns trying to go, in, go up the hill, mm -hmm. slid back down into the ditch, had to get towed out. Suburban came, they didn't see the sign, went down to the bridge, almost tipped over their oil truck or gas truck. There is they, no had to get, they had to get towed out. Uh, people just keep going down there and having to get towed. It's a little ridiculous at this time, and now I need an oil delivery this coming Friday, they're bringing it. Try to come out of my driveway with an oil truck and head up that hill. And you have and to go pick up your mail. And you? the way they're sanding it now is a little ridiculous. The first ice storm we got, what did they do? They just sanded the hills. Not the road. Mm -hmm. That's a little ridiculous. Why wouldn't you sand the whole road, not just the hill? It, it makes no sense to me. The road where the Hearst Farm is, what is that, McKee Road or whatever? Yeah. Every time I go, I go that way every morning when I'm going to stuff. There's so much sand from Stagecoach to Coal Hill 
It's incredible. There's no sand on the loop. Just like he says, a little tiny bit on the little hills, a little tiny bit around the corners. That's it. You go up Coal Hill uh, to the McKee Road, it's perfect. Turn onto the Mud City Loop by Lapines, it's hell the rest of the way up. Yeah. There's no need for that. Grade the road when it's soft. Don't wait until it's frozen and you got ruts like this. Have you tried to drive a vehicle in frozen ruts like this? You can't do it. It throws you all over. It's bad enough when it's muddy. Uh, I mean, you haven't seen us come in here in a hundred years. And this, uh, we've, we're tired of it. I know that's why they call it Mud City Lee. Well, you know that? well I have a great yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's true. This has been going on for for well, a long, long time. Well, they call it Mud City since I was a in kid. The old days, the Mud Brook ran through there, and they did a lot yeah. of logging, and it used to run muddy. That's why it's called Mud City, yeah. not because the. I know. I'm just picking on you. I remember in uh, '82 or '83 when I drove an ambulance up there through oh, deep, deep ruts, got stuck, had to back up, make a well, second try, and the having to go around. When Eric was a policeman, he came to my house for some reason, and he says, <laughs> if you have a heart attack, don't bother pulling an ambulance. They'll never make it here in time. Well, we, we understand your frustrations, but <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm we're really going to do the best we can. This and, and I want yeah. something done. It's, it's 2020 almost, and it's... It's not back in 1960 when I first moved up in there. It's time to get something done. Is there anything, Tyler, that can be done Tyler temporarily? Sorry. How firm is the denial on the temporary bridge? Is there any point in going back to them? I, I can always try to go back, but you know, I'm, I'm going back to the same people. You know, for, from my perspective, you know, and, and you understand what they're looking at. They have a very limited inventory of, of temporary bridges, so they take all the criteria for where we're at. Is there a detour? Are there people isolated? They're looking at all those things. So, you know, they're, they're look, they've got you know, a lot of experience at that level, at the state level, of where they need temporary bridges for. So if, if, if it were, you know, a 50 mile detour, are there people isolated? We probably wouldn't have a problem. But what they're seeing is there's a way out for it's everybody. It's just inconvenient. There's a way out, but there isn't gonna be during mud season. <laughs> You know, Dan, we're, we're a good-sized community. It, it seems like we should have a little pull with the state. Is there any option other than the state to get, to get bridges? Are the contractors? The temporary bridges, you know, those are, I don't know of anybody else that owns a, a maybe bridge in the state other than, you know. Sure, those are, Mike. Uh, Chris might. Blow and Cody this morning said that's an easy fix. It shouldn't be a big problem. But it may, may be as far as the state goes. I know. But the you thing know. is, it seems like this town should have enough pull to get something done. Tyler, is there a, a temporary fix that could be worked out between now and when we can get a, a fixed solution in? Uh, I don't think so because... It's a huge pipe. It's already deflected, and there's a lot of earth and fill up along there, and it's steep sides. And because you don't know what's going on in and around that pipe, you don't know what's going to happen if you put something on top of it. And that's that's why I said to Dan, that I don't think there is a temporary solution. I think the solution is to take like take all that fill out, take the whole pipe out, go back in the correct pipe, which be in the concrete box called or something like it, and. Pack back correctly with Phil. Right. Tyler, why couldn't you get a couple of steel beams, long steel beams, and then cover it with wooden planks? I mean, you're talking about something like a bridge. I mean, if there's, if there's another place to a bridge, then, yeah. we, then you will look into it some more, but I just don't know where that exists. Well, so you may have built me a bridge big enough to take a, a car mm -hmm. across wider than that. Car five or six years ago. I mean, across wider than money. Uh, they, I, I'm sure the town of some place has some steel beams hanging around. Well, we certainly can do some more research, but in the meantime, we can get the ball rolling on a permanent fix. Yes. Let's.
and we want the road Great. graded and fixed from now on and not drop rocks in the road Sharp rocks. just because they're yeah. it, it's an easy fill to fill up the frozen ground it's a little ridiculous I'm sorry for your frustration. I'm sure if I lived right up beside you, I'd feel the same way. Uh, I do. I would. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. So, I mean, you, so, you never see me in here complaining. I complain no, yeah, I never see you complaining. All the time. <laughs> but, but the thing is, we've reached a frustration point that... I can tell. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So, so I wanted to say that... We are... I mean, Dan has tried. He tried to get a bridge. Okay, that's not working. Okay. I think we should jump in and go forward. Another thing I do agree with you that I think we ought to take a little better care of that road if we get that issue maybe. Sand it a little heavier if we need to make well, sure that truck's going to go put now. that sign up tonight because somebody's going to Well, I think we ought to make sure there's nobody going yeah. down in there It's going to drive off something. Yeah. But another thing, all the years that I've done any construction or building, this isn't the time of year to do it. Compaction. If you're going to tear that out and try to compact and it freezes, I would think we definitely would have gone away until spring to do it, but we can get the paperwork and the permits started to whatever we're going to do. Right. Figure out what we're going to do. Well, you know, and to your point about why did they put the culvert in on the angle, there's there's no guarantee that the state's not going to make us straighten that out and go back to the you know, the original stream channel. I mean, you know, I don't know that they will, I don't know that they won't, but. You know, anything that we do up there will have Can to have a permit. Can environmental people get involved in this? There's no doubt in my mind yeah. that we're going to have to have a permit from the yeah. agency. And if you alter resources. the path of the water at all, yeah. you're going to be right. Just, they're just, you know, they're, we're going to have to have a permit from the state to put it in. You know, I can't even get my mail anymore. I have to come into the village to get the mail because of... She can't turn around. She can't yeah. get... She has to back, back up the hill. Mm. Can't do it. And I want to make sure I'm getting a load of fuel on Friday, and I want that hill sanded, sanded so that Bourne's truck doesn't get stuck again. Is the uh, clo road close sign close to the entrance of the road? I, I, I can't picture where it's it is. It's right by Rooney's farm, just as you... But he's the only one that can go down. It. I'm the, the only one. to everybody else, but... But I mean, if, if someone is driving by, they just they don't get down where the road is, where the bridge is out, where They're the culvert's out. They're, They're not supposed, supposed to, but they do. It says road closed. What's the, what's the, question? the question is, is the, is the road closed sign up close enough so people aren't going down the road by mistake? Yeah. It, was, it is until it moved down this Okay. So, so there. All right. And they can't put it in the side. middle of the road because the plow has to come down the hill. Yeah. But we've still had a problem with people going by it. You know, they, they ignore signs. People sometimes will ignore oh, yeah. signs and just drive on by. You know, this is kind of, I, you know, I, I would like to, you know, the board to consider it because one of the longer processes I have to go in through cases like this is, you know, the bid process. You know, Tyler um, has done a lot of engineering work for the town. At least let them get started with the design, maybe, and, and the permitting process on this, because that will speed us up a lot. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, I don't like to go sole source. Um, I think it's always fair to go out and do a bid process, but in a set of circumstances, I think it makes sense to maybe you know look to Tyler to at least give us a price first before you start it, um, so that we can have Tyler start on this. He's, he's experienced doing it. He's done a lot of these projects. He knows the area, he knows the, the people at the state to work with. That'll certainly speed up the process as far as getting something done. Is the, is the expense of this thing going to be something that's going to hold it up? Is it a huge expense uh, to so this state? The, the culvert right. itself is a, is a large expense. Just give us an, an yeah. estimate. It could be a, you know, over 100. So, and we do have bridge reserve funds, Tina. How much? Yeah, we have $179,000 in bridge reserve. So, you know, we, you know, with plus the engineering, um, I will be real honest with everybody. You know, Kevin and I um, met with the FEMA officials for the, the initial survey for the damage. It's kind of hard for FEMA to come in and replace something, you know, that's maybe 50 years old. And, and no, it's not. Uh, that right. So I just, you know, I think a lot of people look at, it, you know, was this storm damage? Maybe yes, maybe no. They may give us some money at the FEMA level, at the federal level, but, you know, they're looking at and they're looking at trees that are growing up on the side of the road that are, you know, 
How much did FEMA give so far? They no, haven't I mean, given anything because they, the governor hasn't even requested the, yeah, the disaster. Yeah, because I read in the newspaper something like $3 million. They said it's probably $3 million in Mud City alone. <laughs> Oh, Dan, yeah. another thing is, you know, uh, when I complained about last summer, even our ditches weren't cleaned out, which really surprised me. They go around every year, they clean out your ditches. They didn't do that this year. It's, uh, it's like they've just forgotten about us up there, and it does make you mad. And that culvert is fairly new when I say fairly within the last 20 years because it was a wooden bridge for ever since I moved up there which I said was over 50 years ago so he's been coming up here for 71 years ask him was there even a culvert there back in those days? well we get all over it so we can make a motion to uh, get the ball rolling yes that will help I make a motion that we Hire Molly Associates to develop uh, a preliminary estimate for a replacement using box culvert or a uh, similar design. Second. Is and there any further discussion? With the state to I, I don't mind asking again to state. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. um, I, it, it, you know, it never hurts to ask again. But I don't want to get anybody's hopes up just based on what they told me before. We can try. Is there any point in looking they into building a bridge? Building. With respect, I'm not here. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you what I've heard twice from, from Tyler is there is no safe way to make a temporary fix on that bridge. Right. No, no safe way. Well, I mean, I, I feel, I'd say that getting the V-Trans temporary bridge would have been a solution, right? So if there's something similar that can be done, like the temporary bridge from V-Trans, then that, that could be a, a possibility. It's just a matter, the matter of designing it and building it versus doing this long-term thing. It's, like, it's a matter of what are you trying to do quickly and how long does that take and cost versus just doing it correctly the right. first time. But right. it, it, might be, it might be worth a little bit of time to, to look into other options for a temporary bridge that can be done. Yeah, I, I can see if there's any options out there besides the state for finding, yeah. you know, either yeah. maybe bridge or a Bailey bridge or something like that out we there. We talk to Chauvin's and Cody's maybe. Yeah, Lisa, because, for, <coughs> because for a permanent bridge, it's going to take five or six months. Correct. It could take a month. And believe me, uh, mud season, you're not so going to be able to make it up Lapine's way. I don't care what they do no. with the road. Get one of it's Dave's, get one of Dave's tractors, he'll take you. You can't even make it down. Nobody goes that way during mud season because you can't make you can't it. do it. Just borrow one of Dave's tractors, he'll get you down. Yeah, yeah. right. With, with, with the road over that culvert, it's not going to allow us to have a bypass bridge while the, the fix is, the permanent fix is being put in place. So as soon as we well, start I that understand road, that we're going to close the road again. I, I can understand that, but it'll be uh, springtime, or uh, they won't be doing that until May or June. Mm -hmm. And at least the road will be okay, uh, the other way to go, mm -hmm. you know. But okay. as it is now, uh, just when we had that thought, yes. uh, that bad. road became almost impassable. It was the only road because down through um, Coal Hill was fine. You can come borrow my side by side, Lee. You can take that up to your house. And well, even, even UPS gave me a note. Can't get there from here. Yeah. Well, That's what they said. Let us vote on this motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed. Well, thanks for listening, and I'm sorry you're so heated. But. Hey, I understand your frustration. Hey, I, I, we feel bad, but we'll try to take <laughs> better care of the road. Bill for my flat tire. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it says right here, Dave. Yeah. 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 Give it to us. Give it to the Erica. Give it to who? Em? <laughs> <laughs> Give it to Erica. I do. What's your name? What's your name? Yeah. Are you on there? Did you sign up? <laughs> All right. <laughs>
All right, we'll wait a minute, then we're going to uh, the Do Hamill Pit. Space the road Maybe that would like the space From Mud City? Yeah. To No Bridge City? <laughs> uh, the bridge to nowhere? I think Lee ought to get more Yeah. Yeah. Give right to the Yeah. I just said Lee borrowed one of Dave's tractors. Let's get around. I know what the clock is. I didn't go on their road. I'll go on the goals. That's where I thought it was. It's going to be a late one. I knew it was bad. It's going to be 10 o'clock. And I think the whole winter is going to be like that. I'm afraid. There's no rush on it either. No. What is so funny to me is complaining that two days later, you know, it's a bunch of degrees and every year we don't go down. Right. I know. Oh, I know. It's like you said, that's what it is. Yeah, it is. They're mad at me, but it's true. You can now tell you, my dog's working on the next stop. Are we recessing? Yeah, next time we're going to be in the water. It's a break. It's a break. It's a break. Are we taking your recess? No. All right, we're going to go into old business now. We've got approved New Hamill Pit Act 250 application and force management plan. Are no, no, you going to change that? It's not for approving. We're just, it's well, it's, it's just approving approved. the application. Okay. Yeah, I think it's in All the right. Just so we know. Yeah. We've got to make it. Hi, Tyler. Thank you. We, are you charging us for tonight? <laughs> no. Double, double, triple now. Tyler, the answer is no, it's not in here. It's on the bus. Is this stuff? Uh, no. Uh, Go ahead, Tyler. Yes, I'm sorry, wait a minute. Yes, it is. It is. Yes, okay. Just want to make sure. Uh, okay, so uh, hello again. Uh, I'm talking about the two name wall pit. Uh, so since our last meeting, uh, we made some a few changes to the plan. I just wanted to go over that. The most recent set of plans are in front of you, uh, and the, the application has been the active the application has been updated accordingly for what, some of the things that we changed. Uh, something very simple: we just revised the report of each of the sheets. So as you flip through the sheets, you'll see that North is is up. Just to give you the actual plans as you're reading them. Uh, as Somebody commented in the last meeting. Uh, the other thing that changed is, along with the multi-sector general permit, which is basically like the erosion control permit to the state, uh, we added some, some information on sheet C2. Uh, and I'm not, I don't have it in front of me, but if you look at sheet C2 and you look at the access, existing paved access road going up, We added some information about the, the existing stormwater controls that exist along that access road. So we met on site, uh, Kevin and I did, with the state of Vermont uh, stormwater department to talk about this site and how it applies to the multi-sector general permit. The multi-sector, the MSGP, is basically like the erosion control permit for gravel pits. And uh, sometimes you can be exempt from them, uh, sometimes you can't. We are pretty close to being exempt uh, because the pit itself is, is self-contained. Meaning when we go in there and we start digging out the pit, whenever it rains, the, the stormwater runoff of the pit is contained within the pit. Much like phase one and phase two has been all along. But uh, the MSG permit is something new. It came out after phase two was permitted. Uh, and it takes into account everything on the property, which includes the access road which does have potential stormwater runoff. And so we, we walked up and down the road uh, and checked out how it exists today and, and how it will work in the stormwater events. You can see we added some of the existing culverts that are there uh, up on top <coughs> in the middle and down below and added some existing uh, sediment retention areas that exist there. So 
uh, we're kind of in good shape, but there's going to be an application that goes out to the state for the multi-sector general permit. And so this information was added to these plans to complement that application. Uh, the other big change. Can I ask you a question on that or what way? Yeah, uh, probably good time for questions you, on that specific. Did you do that? Um, were you aware of that slumping happening there between the road and the river now? Maybe that just happened since the flood? Uh, like along that? the edge? Yeah. Yeah, so we were actually out there, boy, probably a few days after few the days Halloween after. storm. <laughs> uh, the state saw that. So that was part of that. Yeah, yeah, so that's part of that. Um, as part of this uh, proposal, we are proposing. Uh, that where the culverts come out, that we're going to add some riprap there to make sure that where the water is exiting uh, from those existing culverts, that it's not like not going to erode or wash away. The goal of the multi-sector general permit is that you are not discharging stormwaters, you know, into receiving waters with any significant turbidity in them, meaning that things are treated and have some filtration to go through and such. And, and we think that existing conditions are close to that, especially when we add a riprap to the culverts. So that's that's what that is. There's there's another washout that that's further down the river. <coughs> that I don't know if anybody's aware of it, but it's a, it's a potential disaster. If you if you go down toward the gravel pit on the paved road, there, the point there where the mountain bikes peel off to the right, you see that, that fork, yeah. Coming back toward you you get you know, toward you on the, along the river. You get to a point right about there, and you look down, and there's a massive washout there that was left over from the Menashe years. When they, they shut Menashe down, and they sued him, and they fined him, and it all had to do with water pollution, and a big mess in the river. And there's, um, there's uh, silt fences kind of hanging in the mud down there. And the washout, every time I look, I'm amazed at how it's, it's working its way back up. And it's, it's not far from that road, from where your finger is. Yeah, Watch down. Watch down. Down. there is a there's basically a, a, road, a small roadside swale uh, on the top side of this road, and then it kind of dumps into more of a real swale, and then it drops all the way down the road. And it almost looked like it was an intended setup trap down there. Is what it looks like from up top. It's been a long time. I don't know, but it's it's. I'm just telling you that it's one of those invisible things. It's, I don't know what can be done about it. It's, Okay. It's, it's getting bigger and bigger. That's something we can look more into. This, uh, this multi-sector general permit isn't like part of the Act 250 permit. It's its own thing. But Act 250 requires you to go get it, right? So it's on the checklist of the Act 250 application. But the, the multi-sector general permit itself is kind of a living uh, document, meaning sometimes you take uh, action on a, on a project, and it, it, might, it might be overdoing it. And then they will basically say, hey, you're, you're overdoing it. You don't have to discharge. The permit kind of goes away. Reverse uh, the other way is that you know you need more to be done. So after maybe a couple uh, rounds of testing, a couple quarters of the year, it may realize that we need to do more to this to the site to increase the, uh, the, the stormwater control. So to that point, uh, as we submit that application, we start working with the state of Vermont stormwater department and monitoring the stormwater discharges that they may requires to do more and may require us to do less. But were, were you, was anybody actually aware of that spot that I pointed out? Yeah, so I said when we were out there walking, we saw that that, that there was a, a swale line going down there, and I said it actually looks like an actual sediment retention area. Well, I don't water is supposed to take I don't first know and then overflow into the river. I, I'm not sure if we're seeing the same thing. It's, it's, this is a washout that's 30 yards wide, 40 yards wide, and all the way from the river almost to the road there. And it's just coming, it's increasing. I, I bet you haven't yet. You have to you have to look out through the blackberries to see it. Yeah. It's it's worth it's worth looking at because it's a sleeping nightmare. Really. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We're, you know where you where you see that best is from Briggs Farm across the river. Okay. That's you look forward to it. Otherwise, it's really hard. Yeah, it's, you know, those things we can we can submit as is, and, and uh, those are things that we go take another look and of concern and been added to, added to the plan. Um, so the, uh, the other major change is that we uh, backed up the, the lower portion of the, of the pit. So, uh, so we had, there was a discussion previously about how uh, we had phase six in this lower area where boring B7 was. Uh, we knew that it wasn't great results in B7 um, uh, given the concerns that were voiced and 
talked about it with Dan, it didn't make sense, so we just pulled that back uh, and excluded that area you know, from the current plan. And uh, what it does, it just brings us back to five phases. Uh, the total area becomes just under nine acres of total, uh, and the total cubic yardage is about 700,000. So uh, not, a, not a lot lost there, really, because it was kind of a shallow dig in that lower area anyway. So you know, not, not much of a change, but now we brought it out of that, out of that area. Uh, so those, those are really the major changes to the plans and just little minor various updates. And then the act of the application itself was revised to account for the changing number of phases and the areas and the, and the quantities. So those were, those were really the updates since the last round. Uh, Has there been any, um, anything addressed about the Japanese knotweed? Because we had some concerns with that. Yeah, in the forestry management plan, uh, we had a uh, Fran Sladek. I have a hard time pronouncing that. Yeah. Uh, you know, he did a full forestry management plan. I believe you all have that. Yes. Uh, have a chance to we look do. At. He addresses uh, he addresses that a little bit, but uh, we're not we haven't really taken anything further than, than what Fran had, had noted as far as keeping an eye on it. He does um, offer <laughs> remediation plans with some ways to control it in the forest management okay. plan too. Okay. So there, there is that piece of it in there. Um, I think he has a significant thing from forest management plan than before. He does recommend some logging take place to maintain the health of the forest at some point in time. So there are some areas up there where he does recommend that. And that's <coughs> different than anything that I think that we've ever done in the past. Um, any type of logging all once again this isn't going in and clear cutting it's, it's going in and do a very selective logging just to maintain uh, the forest. So let me ask you this, when just asked about logging is dangerous, <coughs> logging is best done in this state on frozen ground. Correct. We don't normally run tra truck traffic up into that area this time of year. Correct. How does that impact our current permit? That's something you that would have. Would that all be encompassed in, in ultimately an approval of the, of the application we have? I would refer back to the old forest management plan, which I can't remember off the top of my head, obviously, but it exists under an existing Act 250 permit. Mm -hmm. So if it's something that wanted to be undertaken by the board uh, to, to, to look at the logging that Frank suggests, we can compare that to with the original forest management plan, which I can assume would be a whole lot different um, and see if that's applicable. Do you think it would be maybe you know, get the logs to a landing and, and wait to bring them out in the spring? Something along those lines. Uh, the other thing that was completed, there was a concern about uh, uh, Don Avery's well. And so we did, a, we did an analysis, basically a, a surface water and groundwater analysis, uh, considering the location of the well, the location of the pit, the revised pit. So we looked at you know this current plan, not the original plan. Um, and you know, like our original recommendation was that you know there are there are no expected impacts to as well, either from a surface you know runoff standpoint or from a groundwater standpoint. Uh, we reanalyzed the the borings that were done. Uh, there was uh, there was water discovered in some of the borings, uh, but in the areas of our pit proposed pit extractions and the depths were not hitting that groundwater table. Uh, furthermore, we're about 700 <coughs> horizontal feet uh, from Mr. Avery's well and about 100 feet up. Uh, so just given, and I think you guys have it in your pack of the, uh, the draft analysis that we did, just coming out with the same conclusion that there's no expected impacts from either, from either perspective. Uh, now having done that uh, and talking to Dan, uh, the plan is to go get basically a, another opinion to you know, support support our findings, you know, just to be sure, uh, and, and you know, help Mr. Avery feel uh, more comfortable about the uh, the lack of any impacts that would happen. So we're uh, we're working. We we can submit this application as is uh, with the analysis that we've done, and then get the you know the concurrence or another analysis done by a, uh, another hydrogeological firm or associates. And, have that support what we've already found. And then submit that as a supplemental piece of data for the activity application. So at this point, we have a set of plans 
uh, five sheets plus a sketch plan sheet. Uh, we have the act that the application completed. We have uh, close to a dozen exhibits that are attached to it uh, that we've discussed in the past, which are you know, the letter, the forestry management plan, uh, the letter from uh, historical and archaeological services, the letter from the Department of Agriculture, the letter from wetlands, uh, the list kind of goes on and on, but it's all the things that we've done uh, to get all the sign-offs from all the different agencies at the state level. So we kind of have the whole package ready, uh, buttoned up and ready to submit. How about the recreational piece of it? How uh, that's going to be in there? Yeah, the, the recreational piece is, is really, uh, it's mixed in the application. You know, it's kind of, it kind of finds itself all over because, you know, the, the questions in the Act 250 application are not specific to any anyone thing, right? So it says, you know, what, you know, what, what things are you doing to protect the safety of the public? Right. It's a pretty vague statement, and we tried our best to answer it with regard to pit operations and also recreational activities. Um, so we talked about the parking lot, or reusing the existing parking lot, and working with those homeowners for an easement for that parking lot, so that uh, the current conditions that have proven <coughs> to be safe thus far remain. You know, So different areas of the application are, are, are uh, inclusive of recreational trails and sometimes it's not mentioned at all because it's not really applicable. So there in there. Uh, various mentions here and there about how the recreational trails are used and and, uh, and such. But well uh, you know we talked about it before it's kind of a little bit of an unknown how the activity board is going to treat it, what they'll come back with, but we try to be transparent in what was happening out there. We're showing on the plans. Um, you know we didn't we didn't go to the nth degree and, and, and go down a rabbit hole as far as the recreational trails are concerned because you know we don't think that that's necessary you know i think showing them here on the plans having uh you know having a parking lot out there and having the ability for this to be used and having it have existed for as long as it has goes a long way so that's that's how the application presents it and describes it okay is there any other questions i guess i got a question on the recreational trails up there like is the town going to be liable for anybody that gets hurt up there on town property? And how does that work? That's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> it's, you know, general liability. You know, um, people go out and use roads. They use our sidewalks. They, you know, as long as we're doing our best to make sure everything is done safely, and that's one of, I think, one of the, the things we don't know what Act 250 Commission will say about this, you know, whether, you know, the recreational trails, will look, they'll put more conditions on them. So um, we don't maintain them. Obviously, there's a group of people, volunteers that maintain them, you know. Um, it's, we have general liability that, that covers us for those kinds of things. But that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I don't really understand all that, but it seems like an issue to me. Yeah, anytime you own a piece of property like that, you're going to have that chance. But we have insurance that covers it, and just luckily nothing's happened so far, and hope it won't happen. We hope we got insurance covered. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the right. other thing is, you got to think that we got a forest up. Um, yeah, maybe. You know, people go up there and walk and ride and right. hunt, and we don't have insurance on them, so. Right. So it's kind of. It's a liability. Yeah. Wouldn't you be covered just like the rest of Vermont where this, the landowner is not liable unless he charges? That's what makes makes Vermont successful. People can't be sued. I wonder if that doesn't hold for the town also. I mean, someone like to sue you because you have no money, I think. But there's a right. yeah, yeah. Actually, I don't know if you're. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> about, about suing the town because they have a lot of money. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but I think you may just be covered like everybody else. Any other questions? Don, do you have any questions? I have a couple of things um, just bring up. Um, I've been spending some time out there with um, um, the fellow that's doing the hydrology, the hydrology concentration. That, now, by the way, that's Jeff Hopper, who is mentioned in your application as the hydrogeologist to um, evaluate the potential impact on the Ten Pens wells in the last amendment. So he, his name might be on both sides of this application. He was working for you guys the last time. 
But anyway, um, we're finding that the 10-foot contours that you got there are really, really hard to apply on the, on the ground. Um, I, when I read the Act to 50 uh, recommendations for, for permit applications, they, they talk about two-foot contours. And we need, would like to, in the future, be able to readily tie water table, known work water table elevations and so on, to exact locations. And it, it, it's, it just is so vague, we don't get the detail that we need. Um, would that be pretty straightforward for you to come up with something? That uh, yeah, we, are, we, we would, have. It would just be for that. Yeah, we have three. We have some contours. Uh, just they, we weren't out in there because when you throw those book contours in there, it becomes a, a maze of, of trying to read it. Uh, but we can take a look at see how it looks and feels. It would only be for sheet three, I think. We don't, we yeah, I think the only the only one that we need to come close to be possible is sheet C three because it's zoomed in. Yeah. And the other ones are so far out that yeah. anything else is unreadable. And and it seems that you wouldn't want to pile much on top of them because they're, they're pretty busy anyway. I'm not sure. Right. With, with that one, the dark lines are what you're gonna do, the final lines and the shit and the and the faint lines we can barely see are the existing ones. And the existing contours are at the moment important for us to pick up. And we don't have a way to key any of your stuff to the ground because there weren't any, you know, you didn't do an old-fashioned survey, so there's no flags or really you go up there, it's very tricky to, to figure out where you are. In other words, ideally say if there were if, if, if there were markers at the ends of the lines of the various um, phases, we could go from there and know where we're, what we're looking at. But it's, it's uh, since there's no truth posts or, Flags up there. Yeah, one of the markers out there is uh, yeah. you actually have the, the, the steel post that's on the corner here. Uh, there's another steel post at the bottom. I, I pounded those in. Yeah. 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 Those are good references. But, but um, the, the rest, there's only two references for all, that, all those acres. So we're not surveyors, so we can't really get anything very clear about it. I, I'm just thinking for future, for, for future, especially say there's a site that I've just mentioned. You can go up there, you really can't tell what's happening. It's just because it's just a big blank nothing. It would be very helpful to have some, some bit of flag going, flag going on. I mean, I think if there's a site visit that has to happen, then that's something that can be done. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, basically the tree line is, you know, the open meadow is the pit. You know, so that's been a good, good reference from a, from a general standpoint. If you're talking about individual bases, then uh, yeah, then, you know, some, Stakes and flags can help uh, with the site. If a site visit was something that had to be done, or if that's something I want the board wanted to be done. Um, another point that I should mention, I, I mentioned this to you before. We are concerned that the entire pit is designed so that every single bit of runoff from that pit goes ends up in, in the final phase, phase five, which is on the, on the apple fruit church area. It's the closest to the spring. And I, I know you could, I am not here to argue because I'm not our judge, but you said you felt it wouldn't be bringing any kind of odd water over that way. But I've watched the, I've watched the ground that I'm right now for 30 years up there, actually it's been close to 40 years. And the runoff, I mean, I was just let it run, very didn't care what, ever since the town's been up there, it has to run back into the pit. And you know, it's a, not water you want to drink, it's water that you might as well run somewhere else if you could. There's occasional malfunction of a piece of equipment. I've seen it. I've seen the quarter potties been whacked over a couple of times. Um, the worst scenario was we had an accident, you know, an accident, but it was a misjudgment where the town decided to to dump the pumpage from the uh, from the from the drains out the parking lot, parking at the uh, north end. You know, it all gets has to be all that, all that drainage runs off and the sediment, all that crud has to get dumped somewhere. And one year, right out of nowhere. They went up there and dumped, they dug a hole and dumped that stuff. It was just like sewage. It wasn't part of that 50 permit. They couldn't do it. I made them, they had to take it away. But we have things that happen up there that are un, unforeseeable. And it doesn't look to me to be too hard to get that to drain. Not, you wouldn't, I think, go all the way over to phase one, drain actually down into phase two, where there was no bottom. There were no bottom of that when they got down 70 feet. They never hit any water or anything. Seems like a pump a good scenario to try to not shoot it all over forever and ever on top of the aquifer.
the, the years when the kids are active, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's all packed down real, real hard. The little girl can work in the orchards are kind of impermeable, and, and the water just all runs off that area. The, the work, the actual workspace, would all be now directed right on top of me. Just a suggestion, we're, we're thinking along those lines, trying to give ourselves, that's a little cleaner operation. I'd just like to throw out a little bit for it. Don knows Active 50, the process, uh, step by step by step by heart, because he's lived it for so many years. Just for the community's knowledge, what we're doing here tonight is not stamping this thing in impact. This is simply, we have a plan now from the engineer, we've taken public input and gone back, made some revisions to it. All there are all we're doing tonight is and on the vote, but I assume we're going to approve the plan that we currently have in front of us, which will then go to the Active 50 Commission. They will review the checklist to make sure we've met everything there and then start looking at the plan. And then it involves a public hearing. Exactly. And that, that public hearing, they're going to listen to, this, to the same concerns mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and all of Folks involved in that, all these joint landowners, uh, will, will be notified. Had some concern about from a joint landowner that in Tendenz area that hadn't been notified about tonight's meeting. But our meeting tonight, although warned in our, uh, you know, locally, it wasn't a, a requirement for us to invite all the joint landowners. Uh, that's the Act 250 public here. Right. But uh, anyway, we didn't mean to exclude anybody. We have a very robust list. Uh, email list and the message went out to the folks. But uh, anyway, I just want folks to understand when we, when we vote tonight with an affirmative vote, it is voting on the plan as presented by the engineering <coughs> board. And that's going to go to the Active Fitting Commission. There will be further chances for it. In other words, you're saying that anything I might have suggested here is, for example, the contours. You're not going to, no chance of doing that. It has, it's going to Active 50. That's just uh, sort of a no, I, what I heard Tyler say is that if Active 50 decides to want to do a site visit. No, I, I was referring to the, um, to, to the uh, doing, uh, having more detail on the site plan so we could uh, be really nailed down the, the uh, locations of the uh, boring coals and all that stuff. Uh, I, we, we could, I could add the contours, to the contours on this. If it, I'll add it in here and if it looks like it's busy. Like, it's not too busy then. We can add it to the plans before would, the submittal. Would you add it or would it be a separate sheet? It seems like on top of that it just would be chaos, wouldn't it? That's why they're not in here. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's chaos the other way when you get up there and there's, there's too many spaces between the, the lines. Uh, like I said, I'll take a look. Uh, adding another sheet at this point is not a super heavy lift, but it's a, it's a lift and you'd be changing all the plans and everything. So I would suggest. Uh, adding a new sheet right now at this time, but I would say it would be worth looking to see if two-foot contours could look uh, legible on this, on this plan, C3. And if they do, then we could use that as the plan that's submitted for the activity for now. Well, if it's a separate sheet, can we just give it to Don? Would that be, would that be all right? Does it exist now? Do you have, do you, do you have two-foot covered? A, yeah, it's a layer. Okay. I think, I, mean, I, mean, well, I, 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 have, one, I have one foot contours as a layer. Okay. If it was only two footers, I'd have to actually take the time to go and exclude this out. Okay. Yeah, not a super heavy lift, but a lift. So I don't see adding it to that, if, and then that's changing that if we vote tonight. Uh, if it's just a matter of let him see what it is, so we can. Yeah, it probably, it'd probably be better just to create a, a side sketch plan that was not part of the Action 50 permit, which is basically a zoomed in version of. Correct. C1 here with one foot contour that doesn't have the proposed stuff on it as a reference for people to see. That'd, that'd be pretty simple enough. Mm -hmm. That might probably be helpful for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? I have one nitpicking comment. There's a manifest error, if I like to see in the, in the or maybe I misunderstand it, in the uh, solid, in the partial management plan. And he makes this statement that, that this land does not contain feeder brooks. It only, only contains gullies that run when it, rain, when it rains. Well, there's a beautiful stream right, down, right behind my barn that drains the whole south end of that property. I don't know why it's not a feeder brook. I mean, it's just, just splitting hairs here. I don't see how he got to that conclusion. 
It's, it's, it's a magnificent spring. It's the only spring on the property, but it's it's got to be a feeder spring. And he says there aren't any. Huh. I mean, I'm sure you don't need to change the plan, but it's, it's a funny thing to leave out. I haven't talked to Fran specifically about his friend. I've Fran personally. I grew up with him. Yeah. Is, is the brook you're talking about within the area of the excavation? No, he says, uh, he's talking about the land, that the, 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 pro the whole town property. He, in the introduction, he makes a comment, he makes a statement that there are no feeder brooks on this property. Okay. I just don't get it. See, and then the difference when we look at when I was reading it, I was reading it as he was surveying the land that we were impacting through our phases. Not the entire property, but I, oh, I, all through that. I, I went back a little bit longer here uh, to see. I'm pretty sure it's his main introduction to the property. Yeah. I'm getting old and female minded. Maybe I don't <laughs> see it. You know? we are. <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions? Can we take this to vote? And, and again, like Eric says, this is for the application of the plan, not for the plan. <coughs> application is the key word. Still going to be public comment further down. I make a motion that we uh, approve the plan submitted by Monday and Darren. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is passed. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks Thank for everyone you. else. Appreciate your Good all right, next, approve ECI invoice, stage for paving. And just so everybody knows, ECI did go over the estimate they gave us. Um, Paul called just to verify why. When they got there, based on the conditions of the road, had changed from the time that they did the estimate. So it actually took more asphalt. The traffic had been beaten on it. Um, you know, the asphalt had to be cut back a little bit more. So it took eight more tons of asphalt and a little bit more prep work. And that's the reason why the invoice is over the amount that you guys authorized. Okay. Do I hear a motion? I make a motion to approve the ECI, and the ECI uh, invoice, which totals $10,000. I have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is passed. Next, storm damage update, Dan. Um, you, you heard a lot about what we were already <laughs> did. You know, the big thing was the Mud City Loop Bridge. Um, you have to think last meeting, um, you asked us, you know, for the expenses that we had. I had Tina put this sheet together. I think this is probably the most up-to-date one that we have. Um, I'm not saying that it's not going to change, but it's probably at the 90 to 95 percent level of what we've spent both um, out-of-pocket expenses and what we use for our, our forced labor and, and vehicles. So of this, um, providing everything goes well with FEMA, and you just never know with FEMA, um, we can expect to be reimbursed 75 percent um, from FEMA if the declaration goes through and it's all approved, and then an additional 10% from the state. And that includes our labor and our materials that we've used ourselves plus our hours on our machine. So, so that would be 85%, you, we cover 15? We cover 15. So cash wise, you know, you look at the things that we had to spend, um, the contractor services, and you know, the purchase materials, and then everything else is, you know, money that we're really spending out of our budget for our own labor or our own trucks. So, you know, overall, you know, we'll probably do okay for, for the repairs. So. Yeah, well, I mean, as far as our 20%, would you support 15%? 15%. 15. 15. 15. Right. Yeah, currently, if you add up the, the labor benefits and the vehicles expense, uh, applying it to the total amount is 33%. So we are we have more than put in, I mean, as far as the budget concerned, we want to put in our 15%. 15, yeah. Sir, right. sure, that's usually the way it works. You know, um, you know, we're still going to work and try to get some some money out of FEMA, see if we can't get anything for the the, the, the large culverts. But I'm, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, just you know, I think even what Tyler did on the one on um, the Gals Road, Road, you know, it, it's really you know there was a wing walls a repair there. It's not really necessarily related to, to storm damage. So, um, but that's where we're at right now. Um, I think everything else is all opened up, Kevin. You know, yeah. So, um, 
that's kind of where we're at right now. There hasn't been a declaration yet. The governor has not re requested that from the federal government. I have every belief that he will, but you, you never know. And you know, it, it, it takes a while just to get through the process. And then Tina has been working, Tina and Paula have been working really, really hard to get everything organized and ready for FEMA. Tina, of course, has been through it before. Um, so, you know, um, I, we'll be prepared when they come in. Last time they came in, Tina had everything ready for them. It was actually a fairly easy process once they were here, but it takes a lot of, of work. The guys are out there working. Um, she's going back through and making sure everything material, and you got to look at it from material, labor, trucks, equipment, time, everything that they did on one particular site has to be assigned to that site. It takes a lot of administrative time to do that. So they've been working real hard. Kevin is not growing any hair because of the time that Tina's been spending with them, so trying to get that all straight. So, but they've been working hard to get that together. So, um, and that's where this one sheet of paper reflects all that time that they've been putting into that. Thank you. All right, next, new business, Vermont Community Development Program application for Village Center Apartments. Hi. Hi there. Nice to see you again. <laughs> I guess we'll see you on a regular basis for a while. Until we get through some of this stuff. So, Dan, I just want you to know that when I was in service, the company held a very good record of construction for construction for quite a while. I'm not going to tell you what that was, though, because how would you? Well, I see. I was in the CBs for 23 years. Yeah. You know, so I understand the Billy to Bailey Bridge. Yeah. And that was a lot of fun to go there and see our company name and record. Yeah. And they came out with those new ones and just slide off. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's kind of. You guys know Jim, but I haven't been here before. My yeah. name is Samantha Dunn. I'm here from Housing Vermont. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. So we're here because um, I think, as you know, we're trying to a project, housing project um, in the worst downtown. And part of our funding for that project, we would like to um, apply for a um, block grant that the town has to apply for. That we would work with you, um, the minister, um, to bring money into this project um, as part of the funding for the overall project. Um, part of the funding is, um, a major part of the funding comes from um, low income housing tax credits, which is probably the to the project. Um, but then we have other pieces that we need to, to, to fill the gaps. And this is one of the areas that we have to apply on. And then we'll do we need to Yep, and the, um, the money comes through um, VCDP, or the Vermont Community Development Program, through the state, but it's the, um, I don't know, people know it as the CDBG is what we call it, but the Community Development Block Grant is federal funding, comes to the state, the way that the state administers it in Vermont is through municipalities. So the money is directed directly at a project, but it has to go through a municipality to make sure the municipality has a voice at the table on the development of that project. You guys have had these grants before. Um, in the past couple of years, there's been a big change where we need, we used to need to have that money come into the project as a loan for complicated tax purposes, um, which meant that it had to stay on the town's books for 15, 20, 30, 45 years. None of them are that old yet. Um, but we have figured out with um, our private investors and the state how to bring the money in as a grant, which is really helpful to communities. So now, um, if the project is successful, the money will still come to the town, um, but then the town will be able to grant it um, to Jim's organization to get it into the project. There's reporting that happens just during construction, and then it's off your books. So that's that's a big change. I know. Um, for Dan, who has to deal. Well, actually, for it's, yeah. yeah, technically, it's not really off our books. We grant that money to you. We have to report that, and depending on the funds and how much it is, we may be required to do a single audit if it's a ton of money. Yeah, I don't imagine it will be, but I'm just saying that it really isn't off our books. It's something that we have to still account for. Yeah, absolutely. But I think the difference is 
the way the money used to come in, it came in as a loan. Oh, I know, so I have two of them. Right, so you're doing that every so year. We so right. We're not going to add one of those. The grant oh. is a one-time, is a one-time thing. So you still go through the the front end of that process, but then it no longer. There is no no longer is an annual report. That's right. No more annual report. Yes. Oh, so that's what we're that's what we figured out how to. Yeah. Yeah. Just recently, making, so making these we videos don't have to do that. a lot more easier. Well, that's okay. I don't mind. That's I don't mind if you do that. <laughs> anyway, so it, I mean, it's so for this project, we're asking for just over half a million dollars. The right now, the budget for the entire project is seven and a half million dollars. So it's obviously not the majority of the funding, but it, we can't we can't do the project without it. Um, and so again, we're here to. I know you guys have heard about the project before and from Jim, and the evening is getting on. So I, I, we weren't going to go into the details, but happy to answer questions. But mostly just to get the select board on board with um, opening up the application process and warning a public hearing, um, which is part of what you need to do to apply for the money. And we're trying to make this fit into our timeline with the other things that we're working on, so we can get it done on that time. We actually kind of put a schedule together, so. What we would ask you to do is, we have to warn a public hearing so that the public can come in and have input on this before the project and then again at the end of the project. And we have a tight kind of timeline to advertise that. So what we were hoping to do is um, to be able to have a public hearing either just before or during your January 20th select board meeting, if that would work. And that means we have to get our, our advertising out like next week because it has to be 15 days before the hearing. And then we'd also ask you to um, sign a resolution to apply to the grant. We have a, we have a copy of that one so you can see what that's like. Um, it all runs through this grant years program that Dan opened, so we have to do all that particular pieces. So that's specifically what we're looking for tonight. So we would hope that you would um, help put your Wait, if you will, behind the project by applying for this grant. Um, down the road, we have to make a presentation to the the board that the state board the state board that grants this money out. Um, we'd like to get somebody from the town or some buddies from the town to come and help us do that. Um, if you have folks willing, I think Dan, you came to the Rogers, mm -hmm. and yeah, that that helps a lot with the process. So sounds good. So the, the town is the face of the application, correct? Absolutely. So we and our means the town needs to get our <coughs> notifications into the paper, right? No, no we would do it. We, and you folks are doing a lot of the administrative do piece yes. of that? Yep. I like that partnership. <laughs> we try and do as much as we can. So this yeah. this program is called Gears. It used to be called Intelligence. They changed it on purpose because that was kind of this number. Okay. It's a little difficult to work with, um, but we we kind of work with it on a regular basis, so it's much easier for us to do all the details. If you actually saw what was in there, you'd understand why. Um, <laughs> it can be a little frustrating. It's challenging. It's stressful yep. at times. But anyway, yes, so we can, like if the public that. notice has to be very specific, and, and we can generate that, and we'll pay to advertise it. We just need the select board on board with, with us applying and, and to make sure it's on the agenda for the 20th so that we can put out the public notice. Yeah, it'd be the 21st. 21st. Oh, is it the 21st? For a yeah, day. It's Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, the holiday. The 20th is a holiday. Okay. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Do you need a motion then? I guess. As long as I don't, you, know, you really need a motion. You don't need a motion now, just as long as everybody realizes that they're going to be coming through. You're going to be making a motion later on to approve the grant. Um, yeah, so you this resolution. A you know, so you'll sign the resolution once you know, it's ready to go forward. So I don't need that the need a motion. We don't now. necessarily need a motion now. I think we just wanted to be able to answer questions and make sure it was, that date was going to work so that we yeah. could warn the meeting. Yeah. And uh, we don't want to, we're, we're trying to give you some advance notice of what's going on in the timeline and really ask for your support. So you'd like us to, some of us or all of us to be at the meeting? At the, uh, the, me so, the open meeting? So um, the, the meeting will be on April 2nd when this, or hopefully, sometimes they defer the applications, but if the application moves forward, it would be on April 2nd. And it's always helpful to have 
people from the town. I mean, I you know we can go to the meeting and we're asking for money for the project, but what the board wants to hear from is people from the community. So we certainly do not need the whole select board, and it's not required. But um, if folks are available or if someone from the town is interested, it, it's really helpful for the application to be competitive. And I think it's really nice for the board to get to hear from the community instead of from us. And you, you, you're going to do a community, um, an open meeting here in the community, right? Yes. yes. That's, that's That'll be on the 21st. Oh, 21st. That's, that, that's the requirement. So it's going to be at, uh, during our select board yes. meeting? Okay. Right. Yep. I got that. And then we'll keep you posted on, yeah. you know, if the application comes to the April 2nd meeting and if anyone Where's the April 2nd meeting going to be? It'll, it, it's at national, the National Life Building. Yeah. Yeah. So they won't be here every day. Have a good lunch. No, no they don't. Oh. Yeah, because they have people from all over the state coming. I don't like get out more, so. <laughs> <laughs> What's that, Judy Dan Chicken? <laughs> I'll eat lunch in there. <laughs> so and I also wanted to just say that Eric and I, uh, along with some Jim and some others, have worked in Dan working on the parking solution. Mm -hmm. So, just that that's continuing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's going to be overflowing though. It's, bro it's broader than just yes. this project. We're working on a house, a parking solution for the entire downtown, which positively impacts this building project. So um, I think that's Chris's wisdom in our last meeting was to say we need to separate the two because it looks like we're approving the parking lot for this project, and that wasn't what we were. That wasn't the intent at any time by any of the either side of the table. Here. So yeah, it's, it was a good, uh, very productive meeting. A lot of good stuff came out of it, a lot of good ideas, and it uh, con will continue, I think. It needs to continue. Yes. It needs to continue. And we're happy to be part of the solution. Since you brought up parking, would it be appropriate to just make a brief statement about that? In relation well, to the project itself? Well, I mean, it's, not, I mean, it's not related to the project. Okay. It's a separate issue. We're going to do it anyway and deal with the waste of water out of the parking area and all that. Um, I'm Bob Titterton. Um, my own 46 Pleasant Street. And uh, I've got kind of a vested interest in the business that, on the down floor there. And um, it, I would find it beneficial for the business if we maintain on street parking on Pleasant Street. Just because if you spend any time over there, you see cars pull up, they park, they go in, they spend five minutes to the store, they come out, they pull away. They don't necessarily come into the lot. Um, it's just helpful for the flow and I want to make sure that place succeeds. Yeah, I'm pretty sure out of our meeting the other day, we all agreed that that was probably the end result. Would be on street parking would remain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The the plan that Tyler drew up preliminarily for these folks mm -hmm. addressing the issues of parking in there, removing the planter, relocating a couple of uh, public services that are there, there uh, was creating sufficient parking within that. Moving the sidewalk out, bringing that parking inside the parking lot really wasn't going to. So it wasn't going to positively impact by more than one or two parking spaces. So, it, and it really wasn't uh, uh, worth the money to change it. So yeah, I, okay. we I agreed. That meeting, but I just yep. Two cents there. Oh. Okay. Thanks, Dan. But without saying that, yeah. Close enough of that. Dan, I Also for the same parking question, is there any uh, way to participate in the parking plan? in the planning process or get updates on what you're Sure, add her name to the list of when we have a, a meeting about the parking, which certainly will give you an invite. I mean, it's a, it's not a, a warned meeting because it's not a, a board meeting. It's not, a, well, what, what's the wording I'm trying to say? But anyway, it doesn't meet the statutory requirements for a warned meeting. It's a, there's two board members, not three. Uh, and the rest of the folks there are, they have, uh, Kevin was there, it's folks that, are going to be impacted by any and all of this, um, so certainly you're welcome to come to it, but don't don't uh, look for a warning in the newspaper; it won't be there. But we can I add you to the list. If I have your contact information, I can add you to my yep. email list. Right now, I was waiting for Eric. We're tentatively scheduling one for February, or January, January third, third, nine a.m. Yeah. I'm waiting for my January schedule to come out okay. tomorrow, and right. I'll be on the email with you. Right. So. All right. So I, that's not confirmed yet, but if you can give me your contact information, I can put you on my email list. Just so you know, any of these meetings that they have like that, 
it's open to the public if it's a public yeah, meeting. That was my question. Yes, you're welcome yeah. to come. The, the difference is warned versus unwarned, that's all. If there's anything they can't talk about, then they would go into executive session during the meeting, but the open meeting, you can come to any other meetings, I'm sure. There won't be any executive session. We welcome session. you. No. <laughs> there's no warm meeting, so there's no executive no, session. not a quorum, sorry. Right. Yeah. 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 We even welcome Lee and Buckwheat and anyone who wants to come. <laughs> yeah. Oh, careful. Yeah, well, <laughs> I want to, well, I want to ask you about this project. And I, I fully support the project. <clears throat> However, I also know that leadership and managers don't have all the answers. And oftentimes, some of the best ideas come from the folks who are pounding the pavement. So I'd like to have you direct the department heads, who are most of them right here anyway, to talk to their folks in an organized staff meeting about the size of this project, number of units that's going on, to see if they have any thoughts, any routing, that they, they may see something we haven't looked at. Tribal knowledge, yeah, they call it. big time. And it can be traffic ability, it can be anything, anything they want to think of. Many of them, the ideas that come out with, may have already been addressed. However, I, I really want to have that. This is a huge project down here. That's a really I want good to be point. successful, but I don't want to end up creating six problems by solving the one big one. Okay. Good. 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 We did have, we always meet very early on with the fire chief and public works and um, power and light before we um, before we came to you or came to the DRB to, to gather their input because we know the project can't be successful. In highway? Without, yes, and highway without those folks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next. <laughs> sidewalk discussion. Um, at the last meeting, we were talking about sidewalks and budget, I think, somehow came up and the, the board asked me to put this back on to this agenda. And specifically, it was about priorities for sidewalks. I think he was talking about the industrial park sidewalk and what our sidewalk priorities going to be. It's kind of handy for Doug's here tonight, too. And I also had Tina put together this kind of sheet for, you know, the fundings. And it shows a couple things, um, you know, on, on the expenses of sidewalks and what we spent the last couple of years. Um, a lot of, this is our out-of-pocket expenses. This is, doesn't in, include, you know, what the, the crew goes out and does, you know, the prep work. So it's, it's really, it's, it's yeah, really, September. you know, the, the cash, you know, um, a couple years ago, town meeting, you know, it's $50,000 put in the reserve fund um, yeah, that's been spent. And then, of course, we've had regular money. Um, and then just, you know, on this sheet shows what we have remaining in current fiscal year's budget. And after we finished up the A Street, the B Street project, remember, um, I asked the board to set aside um, that 60, you know, $61,000. Um, we were talking about curbing at that point in time. Um, for when we got up, you know, on Elmore Street, on up mm -hmm. in that area. But that money right now is set in reserve and you know, really kind of earmarked for, for sidewalk too. So we wanted financially, we wanted to let you know, um, you know, kind of what monies are available, you know, for sidewalks and current budget and in reserve funds. So um, and, uh, that's kind of started out. I mean, it was the board that was talking about the last meeting on what you wanted for priority sidewalks and, and what to be built. And you have Doug's here, I think you can talk about, you know, how we've been constructing them and the process that they're going through and probably where some of the, the rougher sidewalks loop ran the sidewalk machine for a while. And Five years. Yeah. <laughs> and understands those sidewalks too and what it takes to maintain them in the winter especially. So. Mm -hmm. I know Chris was talking about in front of the Copley Medical Building too. Is that sidewalk? Yeah, there's a letter from, from them. Yeah. You're talking about that one. Is that just in front of the hospital? Yeah, the that's medical the, office building, close to the road there. Yeah, on the, opposite the rescue. rescue. Yeah. And is it just the space from the the park one parking lot to the from the exit? Well, no, the exit entrance. to the entrance. Yeah. So I, I had questions specifically about that, but I didn't want to go down too far into the weeds on, on that one area because we have so many other areas to talk about, but. The letter indicates something about they built it and then we would take it over and maintain it. But if it's a paved sidewalk, is that really our agreement? We would take over a paved sidewalk. I, you know, I don't know. I, Doug, you've been here longer than me on that one. And from what I can gather from Dean and, and 
that they built that sidewalk a long time ago. I don't know that there was ever anything said at that time that we were going to take it over. I don't know. That's been there for how long, Doug? Oh, I've been here. That's 25 yeah, years the ago. The deal was is we used to plow that, and then um, the gravel boy started taking care of that. Yeah. And what we do is when the snow gets up there, we move the snow. That's what we do with loader and the trucks. And it's, that's what we've been doing. But the, the maintenance, storm to storm maintenance is done by whoever they have for a contractor to take care of this thing. Well, it's never really, nothing's really happened to it or anything, so that's where it's been. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to clarify the point. The letter says the town agreed, and I don't think the town was at the time, but we're talking decades ago, and we would never take over a paved surface sidewalk. So I'm not sure who, if that's still on Copley property, then the, I just would like to clear up that, that misnomer that, mis no. that the town was going to take over the sidewalk. Do no they have way. anything in writing saying that we agree? Because I have nothing. No, nobody else does yeah. either. I mean, no. And I, I don't know is you know the way that sets back is that still in the right of way there, that paved section. It's like it's on the, the hospital yeah. property. I mean, it, and then it, it curves in, like going by the road, it curves in. It's got an asphalt curving here that's been there forever. And uh, when I plow or we go, we just make a swing in there in the morning because we back up in the morning. Right. Only. So. <clears throat> the other thing that I um, like, their contractor plows it, gravel construction. So they're the ones that are doing all the damage to it with the plow. So now that it's been damaged, they want us to fix it. Well, the whole the, the whole reason I bring it up is because the surface that is pavement. We would never take over a sidewalk that has a paved surface. As a board, we've only taken over sidewalks that were built concrete, two specs, ADA two spec. compliant, the whole nine yards that we have to come up with. So. We would never, anyway, there's more discussion f between Copley Hospital and us to make sure that everybody's talking about the same uh, plan. So that's, that's the only, and I, really, I didn't want to dive too far into this right. because there needs to be conversation with them. But I, my understanding is that, that we would not have taken that over. Correct. I mean, if you looked at our current policy, you know, that we have right now for how, what we take over for sidewalks, it doesn't meet the criteria. Yeah. So, I, I mean, we've talked about um, the, the second half of the industrial park. I've talked about Elmore Street. Um, there, what area? I talk about Elmore Street, Doc, because I, the sidewalk and the roadway are the same level from so much of that right. through there. Um, the, the business owners out in the industrial park have, in, have put in a sidewalk to stand halfway. halfway around. Right. And uh, so there's been discussion here about. Um, uh, the town, the taxpayers funding the second half of it to complete that loop because there's so much foot traffic out there, there's a lot of walkers and whatnot the other day. So. And then eventually loop it, and like you said, Doug, I think last time on the further side yeah, to come yeah. back. I went and looked at that and walked along there, and there's definitely room there, not on the inside, like you <coughs> said. You know. But do we own the land? Well, it's right away. On, like if you're going up. On Harvey's side. It'd be on Harvey's side. Yes. Yeah. Because right. yeah, that's after you said that, I went and looked at it. You're right, oh, not on the inside. There's such a water issue there. And yeah. yeah. But the the amount of pedestrian traffic is unbelievable <clears throat> on a daily basis. Oh yeah. People just go to exercise. But do they when they get to the end? If we go down to Harold Street, do they turn around and go back? I mean, do they do? It? Sometimes they do, but but there's more. There's a lot wider road right there. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you propose is to go down? Put a crosswalk here and have it match back in on. The That's what I think. What do you think? Well, that'd be the, the easiest way to get it back across the road. Yeah, back to Gary's or back to. Right. Uh, that would be the another issue there. Like per se, if you did go down, but on Gary's property, I mean, you're going to be taking his lawn and, and things like that. That would be something to take up also if you went that far. Down. So, or back to Munson and cross back over to the main one. Right. But so, then it's, it's a hard one because you've got the intersection there too. Mm -hmm. So and people don't stop at that intersection. I'm telling you. They, I know they don't. They, they don't. <laughs> I see it every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's one of the tricky things. So. Mm -hmm. 
What are the problem areas in town sidewalk? The worst ones. Pick the top three worst sidewalk areas. Yeah, you guys know. Well, Park, Park Street. Park Street is probably one. We can't plow it no more. We can't plow it. We, we've talked it up. I've talked to Dan about it. And we left it alone because it was just ripping the machine apart. Yeah. And people could walk across. It's all on the sidewalk on the other side of the road. So we've left it alone. Nobody's complained about it. This is, I believe, the second year now that nobody's complained about it. We've been leaving that alone. So you don't plow it at all so during the winter, right? No. Do we really, because this is something I've been thinking about with it? what's going on. You, you stop and think every time we put in like a sidewalk on both sides. So uh, we got 12, he told me the other day, well, about, you thought 12 miles of sidewalk. Yeah, well, really you got 22 miles if you got them on both sides. It's up to like 14 miles. Yeah, so so how do we really need sidewalk? On both in, sides. On both sides a lot. No, I don't think so. It's, it's yeah, that's my thing. thoughts. Because it's another thing is we're having issues with sidewalk plows and the more sidewalk we keep putting in, the I mean, I, just for most of, people walking. Most of, on Park Street, it seems to me, there's businesses, I think, now on there is. the south side. I mean, the there's still a couple of residents on down towards the end. But most of the pedestrian traffic is you know, from um, mobile housing and, and, yes. right. and on down. The bed and breakfast, I think, became apartments. Yes. Yes, it did. Um, so you know, most of the pedestrian, there's you know another apartment you know, um, right there by the parking ride. So most of the pedestrian traffic is on the side of the street where the good sidewalk is. Right. Um, so. And the other ones probably could, we could put a crosswalk across so they could come out and cross over or something maybe like that. I, if we're not going to maintain a sidewalk there, why wouldn't we give it back to the, the homeowners there? Good idea. Right. Excavate yeah. it, fill it back in, top soil. Make it long. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's what we just got yeah. to drop it. Yeah. Is that what you think? Uh, yeah. yeah. Getting rid of it, grass it, and be done with it. Yeah. And, and again, the more of that we can do, I mean, if it's and not... You know, we don't need to have a double. No, not up there for no. sure. A lot of those places. Well, we can, we can start that, you know, um, and I, I, I don't think anybody's really used that piece of it, you know? Thank no, God. I don't know where we would really yeah. do all that. That sidewalk yeah. is the old style where it had granite chunks in it, rocks like this. It's that old of the sidewalk. Yeah. It's just deteriorated now. So that wouldn't need to go out the bed anyway. We can do that internally. We can do yeah. that internally. What about uh, Elmore Street? Well, what happened, for one thing, we got to the fire station when we started the project over here and we just run out of time. So that section there, something should be done to continue up through. Um, By Brian's house and yes, up through. Yes, something there. Yeah. Well, I know that you guys plow with a pickup now, and some of that falls back down in, so half the sidewalk disappears, so Richard will tell you. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no real, you know, section that is sidewalk at all, kind of just one wider road that people walk on. Because it's done with a pickup, you know, yeah. most of the time. But that's why I know Eric was talking about real granite curbs and actual sidewalk up through there. But I don't know if that's the best solution. I, I'm asking you guys what you think. I think it would be safer. Yeah, it would for sure. sure. It would last. It would protect the sidewalk uh, because then the sidewalk machine's going to take care of it. Right. Basically. And uh, price will slow that traffic down too. Yeah. 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 You know, talking about going to one side of the street, and you know, just one side diving, but the side that your house is on, if that sidewalk went back to lawn all the way from there to Maple Street, would that hinder the residents on that on that side yeah. of the street? Well, that way they didn't, wouldn't be plowing my yard no more. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then you'd add side on Jeff's side. I don't live there anymore. Well, I know, but I'm just asking. You lived there for many, many years. I'm yeah. asking, with the the sidewalk out there, was it advantageous to the homeowners down there, or could they live without it? And I'm only asking for one opinion. I know a whole street full of folks now. Well, I know back when my kids went to school there, we, you know, we'd send them across the road. We'd walk them across so they're on the side of the school and have them go down that side in life. So, so I don't see why, again, the same thing. It does. It just comes up dead ends at the, that last drive. Right. And then you're on your own. You'd get across and be in the road. So. It'd probably be so much better for parking and people would up be. above and everything else. I mean, We've talked about that too with the shop. Yeah. Like if we remove it, then there's give more parking. Road, yeah. Don't turn it to lawn or half and half maybe. Give yeah, it more sure. of a parking yeah. spot Most there. Of it, there's not much of a grass strip there anyway. No. Until you get down in front of where like um, the, the dentist office is. Yeah. 
There used to be a grass strip there in front of my house. Yeah. And we kept, every time we'd go to park, we'd park up onto it a little bit to get out of the road. And you know, it got so uh, no grass grew. So, so you caused the problem. Yeah. So <laughs> the question comes back money. now to, Chris threw out a figure in his email today yes. um, of $200,000. He would support 200000 or more uh, for sidewalks for next year. Well, what do we have? We have, well, one thirty seventy two thousand dollars available. Plus the 60, current. right? No, that is the no, that's with the 60. Oh. Yeah. Plus whatever we would put in, what did we budget next year? I think we put 50 in next year's budget already. Right, we did. Yeah, just because that's the number that keeps floating back around town meeting. So, right. Um, so I, I, I guess what I'm saying is we, it's hard to tell. With a paved road, you can say, yeah, it's a mile, it's $100,000. It's hard to say based on how much work there's going to be. For every sidewalk may be a little bit different, but how far will our money go? Can we do more than one project? Can we get some estimates? Yeah, and can it be all done in one summer? Well, we know that the industrial park one back around was 40,000, so it'd be like another 40,000, get it back so, how many How many linear feet did you do on Congress Street there? Do you have any idea? Well, I can't tell you right now. The total expenses for the Congress Street sidewalk was $41,000. Now, that's out of our pocket. That's not Doug's right. and the guys, but that's how much we paid with Jim Bradley and all right. right. that. That's at Congress Street. So, you know, that gives you kind of a perspective. I mean, yeah. That's, you know, with us doing all the prep work, too. I mean, you know, it, it, these guys go out, they prep it, they get ready. Song. Yeah, I mean, so well, there's. I'm thinking the, the industrial park would not involve our guys. I don't think that would all go out to bed, wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean. Well, yeah, Minash could do it. And they, they, yeah. they gave us a good price. Yeah. And they did, did it. Oh, we should go out to bed. Is there, is there yeah. granite right. on the north side but of he'll Dunmore do it Street already? Sure. Yeah. Main Street, Dunmore Street, is there granite there? Uh, no, it's all concrete, all rotten, it's shot. Yeah. It's gone. Uh, you know, in the past, we've, we switched over to granite curbing just because it lasts so much longer. It's, right. It's, it, everything about it's easier. Um, Is there anything bad about granite curbing from you guys? No. Once it's in, uh, if it's done right, it stays it's permanent. right there. Yeah. The only thing that happens is. Because and it's going to happen eventually anyway. Somebody digging into it, little chips and, and stuff, and that's about it. Now, can you do like he's? You said the budget of what? Two hundred thousand. Chris had to figure out that he would support a two hundred thousand dollar for one year. Put into the budget, yeah. To can we do two hundred thousand dollar sidewalk in one well, year? Depends on how you want. I mean, if you if you want to. Put out a contract for two hundred thousand dollars in the No, of course you could. Then, yeah, but so you can I break it up into two years yeah, or three okay, years yeah. too. Um, I, I think the the, the thing is right now with the way we do sidewalk, you know, I think it's at least my perspective. Everybody can disagree with me. Is the way we're doing sidewalk now is is probably about the most cost efficient way for us to do it. But I can't see that with the work that these guys have to do that they have enough time in the summer to do any more sidewalk than what they did last year. No, right. It, it, there's just not there's just not enough room time or anything else, and I think there's stretch sometimes to even get done what they did last year. Yeah, I know. Yeah, everything that they have going on around them, you know, yeah. you know project wise, um, I think over the years when when I first got here, we were setting curbing, we were doing everything, we were placing the concrete. I think we're much better at it now, where we do the prep work and do the demo work, and then somebody that places concrete comes in behind and does that piece of it. But I don't see that we can get through that much work in one summer, follow those, that process. Not with everything else you guys do. No, I, I think if you're going to do that, then you would you would look to get a contractor and identify some very specific areas that you wanted done, and put it out to bid. Yeah. Well, if we if we identify three areas or whatever. Yeah. You or know, if we had to take Elmore Street as an example, and break it out into doable summer projects. Mm -hmm. So you have, and you can assign fiscal years to those sections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just as a rough plan going forward, and then we'd have an idea of how much money we'd have to put into the budget right. every one of those years for those specific projects. It doesn't mean we wouldn't have some other emergency come up or something, but right. as far as that goes, and along with the, the industrial park project as well. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we could have rougher or better figures than just guesstimates. Yeah. Um, if you measured it, me measuring Congress Street, if you use that as a yardstick, uh, pun intended, right. and measure Elmore Street based off of that, 
it might give us an idea how far our money is going to go each year. Right. There are some probably some other things that we yeah we could do as far as like setting the, the, the granite curve. And there's that company that we we hired to do Maple Street. Would it take them a week to do all Maple well, Street? Yeah. Doing it. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a. No, I want to deal for the granite. Oh, yeah. They're called classic curves out of New Hampshire. That's all they do. Yeah. Um, that project was a little bit cleaner because you know there was no asphalt. I mean, we could go in and prep something like that for them. But as far as it, it's almost cheaper than us buying the, the curbing itself, because they supply everything. You know, they supply their own granite. Um, I it was it. I think fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollars, and they did all the Maple Street. Or something like that. It wasn't, you know, but they they were very very good at what they did. And they that's all they do. So if you look at a contract like that, where we're bringing somebody in like that to do the granite work, it, it's actually cheaper, more efficient. So you could do granite and get that placed, and then have somebody go back in. So I, I think there's a couple of different options, just depending on what you're looking at. Um, it's, you know, sidewalks are kind of tricky because sometimes it depends on what the contractors have. I mean, you know, for work, Jim's worked out great for us because, you know, it's the kind of projects that Jim likes to do. Yeah. He's, he's not locked into a, a rigid construction schedule like a lot of other contractors were. So, you know, other contractors, the prices are probably going to be more expensive. So, Go ahead, Doug. One thing about the granite is once it's in the ground, You've got one side, and then you just form up the back side. Right. And I mean, it's <coughs> easier way to do it. Yeah. It is. You got to level off that, and yeah. it's pretty quick. Well, what do you know? What what uh, Jim charged per foot? You know. I, I don't have any idea. We we can figure that out. Yeah, we can figure that out. I, I just. I'm trying to understand what the what the board wants me to put together for you guys as far as I like Eric's plan. Eric's idea. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not willing to do two hundred thousand. No, but if you no. do phases or sections, yeah. I think we can find out the distances, break it up, and make it a, a manageable amount based on what the guys have time to do. That's really the driving force here: is what can the guys mm -hmm. manage in the summer's time, and then apply the the cost. Then, then I think the fifty thousand to sixty thousand dollars that you have in the budget right now does that. Do that per year. Because we we always I don't know if we have granite in this this year's budget because I think we still have some down in the Beaman lot right now. We have some. You used to have it in there as eight thousand dollars a year. Yeah. So if you look at the money that we put in the budget, that yeah. that fifty to sixty thousand dollars that are there. Um, then I think that's reasonably what we can spend in one construction season to do sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Then I think if you want to do something like the industrial park sidewalk, then maybe you want to take that money that we set aside for granite and put that towards the industrial park. And well, sub it out or whatever. Well, if, yeah. if what Tina has here, if I've heard correctly, we have over 72000 available for this upcoming year? No, for the year we're in right now. For the, oh, for the rest of this year? Rest of 2019. Because most of that is money that we put in reserve for the Elmore Street uh, granite curbing. Right. And, and that's available whenever you want. So, so we can have, we have 70 that plus that 50. Plus yeah. the 50, so it's like 120,000 that's right. available yeah. to us next, next spring. Right. If we don't spend any more this year, we still have the 72. So we could sub out, say, Industrial Park and then have our guys do part of Elmore Street. Do Elmore Street. As long as everybody has something to be agreeable that we're going to do the north side of Elmore Street and then eventually abandon the other side. I think that's a good way to do it, don't you? The same thing with Park Street. And then that gives these guys you know, a schedule of what they can work on. Better you know, for our highway guys, too. Um, you know, so that they understand you know, what the board's thoughts are on that um, so that we can, they can figure that out and schedule for how they want to do it. I'd love to see Park Street cleaned up. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I'd love to see that stretch back to grass. Back to grass. Street, even though one it's side. Yeah, landlords now they take really good care of those buildings. No more questions about there, there's other places like that. Well, there's a sidewalk there with a little liability. Well, that, that's the way uh, Common Street was like that. I thought so. It was like that. I and mean, I, I hadn't walked it in a while, and I walked it when I was dealing with Dan. Mm -hmm. And I could not believe it. And, you know, the boys are saying, boy, it's pretty rough. Oh. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I come down there, and I'm like, oh, my God. Or machine, mm -hmm. or guy. Yeah. I mean, it was terrible. Not good for equipment or yeah, I, people, operators, I mean, I, or pedestrians, really. Yeah, yeah. I was just bad. 
Is the sidewalk machine done? Is it ready? Back yet? It's running. Oh, good. Because nice. Buckwheat's not here to here to hear that. Well, you heard me said though. He said it's back and running. It's good still. The other section that is really bad is on, uh, I believe it's East High, the police station side. Yeah. Um, there's a section between Winter Street and Lower Union that we don't plow because it's so bad there. I don't know what you would do with that. Maybe take it out, turn it to black. Oh, we've talked about that, taking it out because the road's so narrow there. Yeah. Hmm. Nobody probably uses it anyway no, to speak of. No, no, no. That's another spot then. The police yeah. go the other There's way. Places, you know, we've got yeah. time to check take a look at it. Out, yeah. Talk with Dan. Hmm. We're all for that. Have sidewalk on one side of the street. Yeah. But, but as far as priorities for right now, you know, the, we're going to agree that we're going to work for next construction season. We're going to continue on up Main Street, Elmore Street, because that that was always the priority before. But yeah. We're going to concentrate on the north side. And as time allows, then we'll, we'll do demo on Park Street yeah. and on the south side of Elmore Mountain or Elmore Street. Yeah. Are you gonna, are you gonna follow up with the Copley and find out about what that's well, going Well, I think like we gotta listen to a discussion with the board. So what I, should I tell them is if they want us to take it over as sidewalk, then it needs to meet our standard. Come, yeah. come, come in and see us and talk to us about it. What's going on? Because uh, again, no. I, I don't want nothing to do with it the way it is, I don't think. Well, I mean, you know, that's what we tell any other no, business right in. now. We we yeah. have a, a con, you know, we have a sidewalk right. standard, right. And, and when the sidewalk meets this standard, then we would consider taking over. I don't know if it's in the right of way or not, but that's we have sidewalk that we plow now that's not in our right of way. I would, they they've written us a nice letter. I, I, I just rather than take up a meeting time, I would say respond to the letter. Yeah. To, to uh, the concerns, and that at some future date we could uh, sit down and talk about it. But it's, yeah. I honestly don't see it as part of our next construction season. Okay. Yeah. What about subbing out the other part of our industrial park with the rest of the money with the other? You know, I think that the the sixty thousand dollars probably that we have set aside that's in reserve now, rather than having set aside for curb. If you know, if there's, if we're not trying to do a big, huge section of Elmore Street, then the $60,000 could be used to, to finish off from the Yeah, I the think it's corner. about 40, I think Gary said about 40,000. Then we could, we could contract that out, we could put that out to bid, and then finish the rest of Industrial Park Avenue mm -hmm. from where you guys left off down to um, Harold Street. Yeah. And then, you know, then in the future years, we get an opportunity, then we can look at doing some more work along Harold Street, kind of keep going doing back up Doug's to land. With the holiday, is there time for you to come back to us at our next meeting and, and give us a, uh, a suggested dollar figure for a budget? Or are we just going to stick with 50000 Well, we got the sixty. So our 60, if 60 should build that sidewalk. <coughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about for FY. I'm, for 50 I think I'm pretty comfortable just watching what we've been able to do over the last couple of years with $50,000 in the budget. And then I don't, I don't think we have grant in this year's budget because we don't no, need we grant don't right now. Grant in this year's budget and you would have to vote to reserve the, what, 10900 from the budget year we're in towards next year's budget, if that's what you chose to do. So that would, give us, that would give us $60,000 next year. And I think, you know, looking at past practice, if, you know, the way we're doing sidewalk now, well, once again, I think, is about the most financially responsible way for, for adding, for, for doing the sidewalk. Um, I mean, we could, we could spend a lot more money, but I'm not sure you get a lot more sidewalk. Um, just because by the time you bring a contractor in to do the demo work and all the prep work that these guys are doing, you're really gonna double your cost. So you could spend another $50,000, but you wouldn't be getting a lot more sidewalk. Right. Um, but I, I'm pretty comfortable with that number because I think that's what we're capable of doing in any one year, Eric. Does that answer your question? Yep. I mean, and that just last year I thought went real good with the sidewalk that we put in. You know, it worked out well. And then yeah. and we did our own hot mix, and you know, when you know, once we got it in there, we had a hot mix up to it, and we did all that ourselves. Okay. Stuff, so. so, do you need a motion, or do you? No, I mean that's in the budget. So you know, that's the way the budget is constructed right now. Yeah. Okay. And then later on, you know, when we're ready to. We'll go out to bid for the sidewalk in the industrial park, and then yep. we'll, we'll get something ready to go for that in the spring. But that really won't be it's okay. just a simple construction contract. Does that sound good to you guys? Yep. Yes. Judy? It does. Very good. Just 
Okay. Go ahead. I'm about the sidewalk. Um, I don't know if this has been talked about in previous meetings. I haven't been here a whole lot. Why not? Come in here. Yeah, right. <laughs> but the, um, you know, we keep drawing the sidewalk. Everybody knows the muscles are drawing. But we only have the one sidewalk machine. And we only have one guy to run it. And the burden for doing that plow and maintaining them, you know, that. The power, loop. It's getting. Another machine in there or something. Yeah. We really need to have another guy. That's what I think. And another machine. Well, we just took out a bunch of sidewalk calls, so now it's less. We <laughs> <laughs> took out about 100 feet. Work with him, Brian. Work with him. Well, we're up to like 14 miles now. That's a lot. And it's the one machine, and, you know, I'm glad Buckley's not here. <laughs> All I'm here for him. So. He, doesn't, he doesn't like the, the holder. And Neither do I. things said about the holder. Neither you know, do I. So. But, well, maybe you don't either. I don't really care. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Totally good. As an operator, you know, I ran it for three years, and Joe's run it for two years, and you can ask him, like, I don't think you're going to find a machine that's better on the operator and better for the safety of the operator and the safety of the public. As far as visibility, maneuverability, staying out of traffic. Then the holder? Then the holder. Mm -hmm. And they are, I mean, I have some literature I can give you guys on. Well, you so run it, so you know. So yeah, actually, actually, what, what it, I got Michael left from Captain Chadwick Farrell, who's giving me a price tomorrow, just to have a price on another one. Just so. Yeah. And I've talked to Doug, and my belief is that we need another holder. I know that's like a, whoa, big deal, okay? But. I really believe that's the way we're going. We need another operator. And you know what happened this last time the thing went down, and that had nothing to do with the whole machine itself. It had everything to do with Chadwick Bayros and not doing the repairs in the time they were given. And that's the only issue that we've really come into contact with. And if you had another machine, you would have a backup for when one went down. We were we had no way of maintaining the sidewalk when that machine was out. We had another machine, that one broke down. That was the tool cat. You all know the horse story of the tool cat. Yeah. So we had we know a plan, that and that plan failed. So, and as these machines age, you can phase one out with the other one. I mean, there's no like future perspective in maintaining the sidewalk, the sidewalk machine. So I have some literature for you guys on the older machine itself and just some like points that. And I also did a review back in 2016 on it, so that's on the back page. <clears throat> and you run it, you ran it for three years? Ran it for three years. And there's a lot of talk about it, you know. People come in and they bad mouth the thing, but. This guy here does. <laughs> Thank well, you. I'll tell you right now, I mean, the, just the service alone, I mean, we have to go way out of state. How much does it cost to, to truck that down there and back? We have our own. So how much it cost to truck it down there and back? I don't know what it costs for the truck and trailer. Okay. How long does it take to drive down there and back? Uh, let's see. It's a three-hour run down and three hours back. Okay. And then to have it all summer long and still not have it back? I mean, I, I just, I'd like to see it gone, but again, I don't work with you guys. That's why I come up yeah. and talk to Doug. The tool cat's another issue. It's, it's bigger. It doesn't fit. Like did you go down and look at the thing and stuff? I did. Too small, in it? Too small. That's what I thought. I just thought I'd ask. It would be, be tore apart. What's see. the thing that's over to Fairfields? That's a trackless. That's too big. It's too big. Looked at that one too. Well, what's the one you drive and what's the holder for called? The holder. The holder's like a trackless, though, is it? Okay, kind of so trackless is a trackless. I just wondered if, if that one, why is that one too big? Is it too wide? It's just a bigger model. It's just, Long, the sand is way on the back and it oscillates in the center. It just, it just by the time you get through someplace with the motor there and the sand there, it would, it's just hard to turn it. You tried it. You tried it. Maneuverable. And if you was to try and move snow with it, forget it. You have you, it. have you guys driven them before? Yeah, we yeah. ran the trackless when we had a storm back, yeah. probably three years ago, and yeah. I was able to clear and open things, but you can't fit through everywhere. There's right. tight spots like in front of the Union Bank and a telephone pole and retaining walls and hydrants. Like there's only like the holders, the yeah. only thing that we found that fits through those. It's small enough. Yeah. So. No, the other day too, I heard an advertisement on the radio about uh, Pete's got something over there. Couture's. Yeah. Pete Couture has has a track list, but he's 
a smaller one that he owned himself. And, and I know he's got one he's trying to, he was advertising on how quick it was. He, he called me up and he had one, a used one set up in, oh, it was down country or something. It's like the one we had at Terex on tracks. Right. Just, no. okay. ASV, it was an ASV. Well, why I'm just saying this is because I'd like to do business in town. Right. And I'd like to definitely do it a lot closer. You know, because well, of the you service. Can't have the machine's not going to last because we're going to be in a worse about. Well, the one we got, the, that holder is going to last enough. How long you had that holder? This will okay. be the sixth year. Yeah. It's like August, five years. August. 180,000. Well, extended warranty. The tool cat lasts right, longer. That's another thing I address in that. People keep talking about $180,000. Okay. When we bought the machine, we bought it with a snowblower, a plow, a broom, a dump body, and a sander unit, and the machine itself. So if you've got another machine, you're looking at way less than that because we don't need another blower. That's why I'm trying to find out with Michael that uh, he's going to give me yeah. the price. Uh, just the machine, plow, yeah. and sander. Okay. Not just from see what from my standpoint, what I care about is the operator. And I care about the safety of the public and maintaining the roof. I don't care about what it costs. If you put in a lawnmower to do the sidewalks, they're going to get beat to hell. And that person is what I care about. I don't care about Well, when we spent the 180000 I agree with you. But when it starts, you know, it was told it's going to last just 20 years. Even if it lasted 10 years, well, here we're at five years and it's down there for a year. That's, that's another thing I talk about in there. Everybody says it's a 20 year machine. You're not going to find a machine that exists that you're dumping salt in every day and taking out 14 miles of life. I don't even think you can get 10 years. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Okay. It's, Especially it's not in the long run. going to happen. Yeah. Well, I'll talk to you some more because. You haven't convinced me yet that the hundred and eighty thousand well, dollars. Okay, on. that's good. Again, I don't wanna you guys do such a great job. I, I wanna make sure but well, it's just I'm can... looking at the taxpayer and I don't see you see anybody gonna buy two of them. I, I just gotta tell you, I appreciate your input. Yes. A lot. I think it's great. I'm glad you guys are here. I mean, this is what I said earlier. Tribal knowledge means like what Eric right. says. You guys know. You guys run the equipment, you know better than the managers do, you know, and I respect that. So I appreciate the input. And the only other thing about the, the 270 when it got bought, that was the first year that it was built, uh, the 270. You never, you know, you buy a lot of these vehicles, cars or anything, you got bugs in them the first right. year out. Right. And they, you know, they improve them and stuff. And who knows? I mean, I'm thinking they got the, the bugs out of them, maybe, possibly. Well, like I said, I, I'm getting the price just to have it, so I know. Well, you know, something that could happen maybe is an idea. You got this one fixed now, so it might be worth, you know, a couple hundred dollars trade in or something. You know, but <laughs> Brian, why are you doing? <laughs> what I'm saying is, for it yet, Brian? We still old. Well, what I'm saying is maybe, like, say, run it this year, because again, and then. Maybe next year try to trade that in for the newer, better model. Well, Even if we lost a little in the thing, get better. Right. What do you but do not when to it breaks it. down? How do you maintain Bob the Get of a bank. Bobcat, get everybody a does it. How do you solve them? Oh, you can find a way. There's no way to solve them. Well, of course there is. <laughs> what was brought up on the uh, toolcat? I mean, have you talked about I'm not one of them per se or anything. That, I mean, again, I would go for that. That's a lot less. And again, I always thought, because you and I talked, that if you had that to do mo most of it, because you told me the other day, uh, the 12 miles, you take one run around, it's three hours. Okay. I'm an eight hour it, day, so, so well, you. Well, when it's snowing, when you start at three o'clock in the morning and you've made three runs per se 14 miles, that's a yeah. lot of miles. Yeah. That's yeah. old information. 12, 12 miles, three hours. That's yeah, old it's, information. It's four. Now, with everything we've added on, new sidewalk, you're looking at 14 miles, and it's up to like four hours, two loads of salt. And so, that's middle of the night with nobody on the sidewalk. Yeah, and that's like, okay, you, you do your whole thing, and you come back to the beginning, and there's three inches of snow there, yeah. and you got to do it again. And pedestrians. If, if I could, this is a great conversation, yep. but we are way off topic. We we're talking about sidewalks, not okay. sidewalks. Right. No, no, it's okay, guys. It's good information. We need to hear it. We appreciate it. We're going to be talking about capital budget. But, yeah. so, seriously, yeah. um, it's not a bad thing. I just we, We're after 9 o'clock now. Right. Yeah. If I could make a recommendation, it is, and it was part of my notes anyway, because I know what it's like. It's 9 o'clock. 
I would almost recommend postponing the highway and the capital budget because the highway is the biggest one. That's what I thought when I saw this agenda tonight. I'm like, well, why is already on the road? <laughs> so, um, you know, this, the sixth agenda I don't think is too big, and I was going to ask to add another meeting anyway for the budget, um, you know, after the first year because it, it's, it's hard to do this after it three is, hours. Yes. Everybody's kind of. I agree because I can make <laughs> you better when I'm fresh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got to be up in six hours. Oh. Yeah, so oh. I, I, you know, I, I think that that's what I recommend is just postponing the table and the, the sidewalk or the, the highway budget and the capital budget. Um, we'll do that on the, the 6th of January and schedule another meeting. Um, nobody likes it on the 13th for a budget discussion so that we can keep doing that, but get the budget wrapped up. But we do appreciate every, everything you guys do. Luke, I'm really glad you're here and your input, Doug. And I, I apologize to you, Kevin, for getting beat up so much tonight, but uh, we're behind you. <laughs> I was watching, I didn't see well, you blood. Yeah, you weren't getting red. Budget, you know, that's, yeah. I'm gonna have to have more time to the machine to clean ditches. I, could, I was watching your demeanor the whole time and I said, we got the right guy for the job. <laughs> and then I didn't go the other day, if I had talked to him the way he talked to me, right. I wouldn't be sitting here, I'd right. be fired. <laughs> but thank you for, for having the thick skin. This yeah. guy here can teach you a lot about that. Yeah. <laughs> it goes with the job. I, I also understood a lot of the conversation he was having about work that wasn't done was before you even started employment with the town of Morristown. Well, in his ruts this deep were... Yeah. Right. Well, jokingly, that's why I said they call it Mud City, you know. Well, I also <laughs> can appreciate the fact that you're using the stone in well, those it was, areas? It, technically, it was crushed gravel from yeah. the Nostra's aggregate pit. They yeah. called it crushed gravel, that's what we bought, and that's what we put down, yeah. but it's more stone than gravel. But it holds up better. Yeah. It does. It's like a slight like special warm-up, you know. Season. Yeah. That's what we use. Right. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next one here, errors and omissions. You want to do those three? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot, you guys. <laughs> Got some hard, keep working on it. And Doug, keep working on your in-law here. <laughs> Were these both about current use? Three. There's three. There's three yeah, different three of them. Two of them together. Yeah. And um, Terry Savings, the, the assessor, wrote up yep. you know, the explanation for what's going on. Do you want to do them separately? You can do them all at once. Okay, let's do them all at one time. Just as submitted, and just make sure as you sign them, there's three different signatures, that I, once again, I get those down here because we need to get those filed. Okay. You want to go for it, Eric? I make a motion that we approve the errors and omissions certificates as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any, oppo any opposed? Motion is passed. Is there anything else we need to talk about tonight? Oh, yeah, we could do that. Make a motion to approve the warrant. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So pass. Thanks, Tina. <laughs> Denny left. He doesn't, he usually has the floor. It seems we're going to table these other budget items. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Wait, are you doing a TA report or not? Real briefly, you you know, do just it? for me, I think you heard a lot about what I've been working yeah. on from last week <laughs> yeah. anyway. Yeah. Tonight, you know, the Act 250 and, and dealing with the, the, the bridge and storms. Um, other than that, just so everybody knows, um, we are working on the Union Highway contract right now, and that's going well. Everybody's sat down and working on that one. I was going to talk about the parking lot. We've already done that. Um, I was going to talk about do another budget meeting, but we've already done that. And then... Um, I'll be here the rest of this week, but then I'll be out until after the first of the year. Me too. So, um, I'll be off. But you can always call me, so I'll be around from both No, parties. don't answer your phone. I don't be a time in there. I probably want to put the chief in charge. <laughs> <laughs> do you need to do a motion to table the, the budget on the agenda? 
problem should do. Yes. Make a motion to table the budget discussion until next week. Second. Two. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So pass. Make a motion to adjourn. I, one more quick, I, I also appreciate the staff's patience because a lot of the stuff that you hear tonight isn't necessarily directed at me or Kevin all the time. A lot of that in, comes into the clerk's office or to Erica or to the finance department and, and they do a great job and are very, very patient. Yeah. Yes. I agree. Thank you. There is no Thank you. name calling during open meeting tonight. I think Kevin's doing a great job. He's very knowledgeable in what he does. I don't think we have any worries going forward with leadership in our highway department. So, yes, I, I didn't, I heard it and didn't listen to it. <laughs> so, select board concerns, let's do those. I, Judy. I just had a question. Um, Chief, when, um, like, when your officers come upon somebody who's in need, you're aware of the um, capstone oh, yeah. and you let them know. I wanted to ask um, EMS if you know, but it was nice. they did the same thing. They came around and they put those flyers and they opened it up and we did ours. Okay. So. I appreciate that she mentioned Sandy Neely. Sandy Neely did tremendous work in this community for folks that need help. We reached out to her so many times in the middle of the night. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah, she's missed. Yeah. Hi, hey, Brian, you have me? No, I'm all set. Eric. I'm all set. And I just want to say sorry the meeting was so long time. We expect to be We blame it on you. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> you you see, Ian does that on purpose. He makes these really <laughs> short meetings when I'm gone. And when I'm here, I look at him like, what? Some things I cannot anticipate. <laughs> yeah. Right. I want to ask one question. We, I think we were asked to get a dedication for the... Yes. Yes. Can we do that next, but, but, the first but, meeting? You have to know by when. I really like to have them all by the 4th of January, but I don't think that's going to happen. Can we, do it on, can we do it on the 6th? You guys can do it whenever you want. I mean, right. You usually figure out who you want to do yeah. the dedication for and then email it to me. Yep. We can, we can have a little... And your select board report. That's from Bob. Bob does his, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Chris is going to do it Chris again. Did it last year. Chris, okay. Chris isn't here. He's oh, doing oh, it. Yeah. Watch it. I make a motion that Chris does it. <laughs> okay. Year. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So fast. Yeah,